Welcome back to the show, Zero to Hear podcast fans. Today's episode is special. Uh, James Garbett joins us. This guy is interesting to say the least. Uh, one of the things I admire so much about him is his fearlessness to tackle literally anything. Uh, we chat in detail about his recent 118 kilometer uh, trail race through Portugal. We get to the bottom of why he thinks it's such a great idea to start his day jumping into a ice filled pool in the morning in uh, in the winter. <laughs> uh, he's an interesting guy. He is uh, one of my best friends. He's my business partner. I admire a lot about him and I've learned a ton from him throughout the years. Uh, this is a really, really fun one and I'm excited to share it with you. All right, Super Sexy Time by uh, James Garbage here, huh? I'm <laughs> not doing it. <laughs> not doing it. I think that was the start right there. <laughs> uh, all right, well, there's a lot of things we could talk about today. And in making some brief notes before the podcast, I'm thinking about real estate, of course. I'm thinking about beer, which likely we're going to talk about because I love beer. Think about hiking. Uh, but I want to start with the crazy shit that you do. And I want to understand... First of all, when did all this crazy stuff start happening? When I'm talking about crazy stuff, I'm talking about West Coast Trail in a day. I'm talking about the 118 kilometer race you just did in uh, Portugal. Portugal? Yeah, Portugal. Yeah. We're, we're live right now. This is happening. We're doing this. Oh, this we is are recording right now. Yeah. All right, we are. All right. All right. I just thought we were having a conversation, Daddy. <laughs> no, <I'm> the, <laughs> this is the conversation. All right. When did it start happening? Oof. Where did these ideas come from? And what, because. I think you were probably in the shift mode when I met you six or seven years ago from like bodybuilder James <laughs> to now Pretty pathetic body extremely builder. lean, crazy trail runner James. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I think it comes hard to say where it really originated from. I, I'm a believer in having a big comfort zone, as you can tell. <laughs> so I, I think it came from... Uh, the the high or the energy I got out of scaring the shit out of myself. And if I go back in recent history to the most terrifying thing that shocked me, um, it was probably when I first did stand-up comedy. I remember I had never been so nervous doing anything. And that was like eight, nine years ago. And I can't remember if I emceed a wedding before or after that, but that emceeing wedding with the stand-up comedy combo, I believe the I think I emceed a wedding first, Thought I could do better at it. Thought, hey, what's the hardest, most terrifying thing you could possibly do? Stand-up comedy was on that list. Making 200 people laugh on the spot. Um, once I got through it and did it, and it actually worked out quite well, I did pretty good at it for, uh, for a first-timer. Um, it just elevated my confidence, and that started me getting comfortable doing uncomfortable things. Do you remember uh, what that first bit was about? I believe it was about my wife... <laughs> loving me but not liking me <laughs> and i believe it was like you know i love that you're a provider and a husband and uh you know a great companion but if i ask her to make me a sandwich she'll say no so she'll say no nine <laughs> times out of ten <laughs> and I, I i'll butcher it i'll butcher it but uh, i think the the punchline was something along the lines of i'll make you a sandwich when you make me happy <laughs> and uh, and it, it, it hit, and I talked about my dog that I, I think maybe it could have been the dog. I had this dog that I said, you know, I don't mind when my dog licks herself. I just don't, I could go, I just don't like the eye contact while she's doing it. <laughs> and so I had a few. There was a sandwich one, a lot of dog <clears throat> stuff. Didn't, didn't have kids at that time, so I'm loaded with more ammo. But uh, I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know what, you know, it, it just, it's there on YouTube. It, there's seven, eight minutes of it. There's some good stuff in there, but, you know, I, I'll probably come back with better. <laughs> well, how did it shift into um, fitness stuff? Okay, so um, fitness is just one avenue, right? Yeah. Like it's not about fitness versus stand-up. It's about doing things that you don't think you can do. And that stand-up comedy led to emceeing 10 weddings. And so 
going from terrified to public speaking and making people laugh to being comfortable with it was all it took was one incident that was scaring the shit out of myself. Were you terrified? Of yeah. Public speaking? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, not terrified. Like I could do it, but not like, not to the extent that I could by the end of that, you know, not, it's a different level. Like, yeah, yeah. I'd be okay. But being okay is not, is just being okay. What were you yeah. scared of to public speak? Cause I was the exact <sighs> same in high school. I was completely terrified of public speaking. When you're public speaking in an audience like a wedding, you have an opportunity to be okay and just get through it, or you have an opportunity to make everybody laugh and be memorable. And I think for me, it's about getting the best out of that experience from everybody there and for myself. And so I wanted to, I love making people laugh. And I thought, hey, you know what? And then once you dial it in, you realize, oh, all you need is like three jokes, you know, for a wedding. And then you just pick up on something that happens. That's embarrassing and reiterate that for a few times. So you dial it in, but it, there's not much to it. And, and you just get comfortable being uncomfortable. You get comfortable bombing. Bombing's a great thing. It's terrifying. It's the worst thing that, you know, you, but you can roll off and acknowledge it. And, and I think the, the thing about stand up, not that I'm an expert by any means, I've only done it a couple of times, uh, is you, you, you learn the importance of being concise or using specific words or you know, when you're dragging something out and it's not funny or you, you some uh, half the time people make a joke and then they drag it out and they're like, oh, you should have ended right there. <laughs> you wrecked it after that. So uh, stand up was the first time. And then the whole physical stuff. Well, I, you know, like you said, I did some weightlifting back in the day. Uh, bodybuilding, no. Powerlifting, yes. And I don't have the frame for it. Um, I, I think what it came down to a couple of years ago, I, I went to Portugal and my buddy Jordan, who's a partner in Steel and Oak, he ran a marathon like six ish years ago, I want to say. And I never ran a marathon up until that time. And I trained for one like six ish years ago and hurt my knee and just let it go. And then I ran a marathon. I actually trained properly and ran a marathon in, in Lisbon, Portugal in October, 2016. So I got that off, off the list. And I, I ran a time, I did a 347, which is faster than I thought it would be. And I trained by basically hiking with my dogs. You know, so it's not your typical, but I was very active and, and, uh, I, I put it all in the line there. I couldn't, I couldn't, there was a, there was a, a curb on the street, sidewalk curb, uh, after the race and I couldn't <laughs> lift my foot to get on the curb. I, I couldn't lift. I had to hold on to things. I couldn't, I couldn't walk. So I, I know I didn't leave anything in there and I, and I think I'll give a marathon another go, um, at some point, but that gave me confidence. Oh, you got the marathon check. And then what, uh, what I found 2017, I did nothing. So what I found is, you know, you have your running routine, 30 minutes a day or whatever it is. I hiking was trail running and hiking was my routine. But if I didn't have something to work towards, it just kind of got lazy. You know, it's kind of like, what's the point? So I thought, you know what? I need to sign up for a race. I, uh, I, I need a purpose. I need a reason to do this. I'm not going to the gym or working. I don't go to the gym anymore, uh, but I'm not running for the sake of running. If, I don't want fitness to be just a habit chore. Like I want to accomplish things. And I signed up for a, um, I think it was like a 50 kilometer race, trail race in Bunsen area in 2018, March. That didn't happen. Well, it, it did happen, but it snowed out. And I just thought, you know what? I don't, I don't want to run in snow. Like it's like a lot of snow. It would be miserable. You basically are in a line behind the people in front of you, or you dart out into the snow and your, you know, your feet would be soaked. And it was just not how I wanted my first 50 K trail race to be. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, I passed on it because I had open houses and I thought let's work and, and coach soccer and be a dad. Um, but I was in pretty decent shape going into it. And then I just started thinking, okay, well, I'm not doing this. What else can I do? And I just Googled like, I, I probably spent five minutes Googling and I came across <laughs> a guy that ran the West Coast Trail. And uh, I thought, hey, you know, let's run the West Coast Trail. <laughs> and this was, this was a thought in my head after the race didn't happen in March. So let's call it first week of April. The thought kind of, I, I found it on Google. I'm like, hey, that's, that's something. Uh, so I kept training. And, uh, and this is like early April. I, I thought I was going to run a 50K race. Uh, and, and I kept training, not knowing what I was going to do. And then around May, I started thinking, yeah, this West coast trail thing's going to happen. Cause I, I was in the best shape of my life up until that point. So I didn't know what it, like, I just didn't know what it felt to, like to be in better shape. So <laughs> in my head, I was invincible. Uh, and I think it was, I think I ran the trail on May 23rd or May 24th. And I decided to run it on May 16th. <laughs> <laughs> So, so I, I was looking at the tides and the weather and I'm thinking, oh, if I don't do it now, I got to do it at the end of June. And 
for me, one more month of training and not crushing beers and, 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 and just enjoying summer sounded so daunting that I would rather run the race less trained. And I just talked to Diana, my wife, and it was like on a Wednesday. I'm like, hey, you know, I know we were, we were supposed to go visit the Power Family. <laughs> no, we're supposed to go away this weekend, but do you mind if I just run the Rest Coast Trail instead? <laughs> She's like, yeah, go ahead. So I took the last ferry out Saturday night and went on a solo mission, slept on a logging road, camped by myself, and then just took off running one day. And 15 hours later, I was swimming across Gordon River at the south end and, and made it. And uh, hardest thing I've ever done. I, I felt so accomplished. Get up to that point. To that point. Yeah, yeah. To that point. Yeah. Uh, yes. And, but <laughs> it, it was, it was amazing. The only thing I wish I didn't swim across the river. <laughs> that was a little stupid. So what was your final time? It was 15 hours. I think 15 yeah, hours. I, I think I started the trailhead at, uh, how, uh, no, maybe it might've been 15 and a half. It's, I, but I believe it was 15 hours. So it's a 75 kilometer trail that people usually take what, six, seven days to do. Correct. And yes. you, so you did it 18 yeah. or 15 hours? Let's, yeah, it's uh, I, on the bus. I was the popular guy. Yeah. Uh, everyone <laughs> there was doing it in five nights, yep. six days, mm-hmm. except for one group that was doing it in three nights, which was considered fast. That is fast. Yeah. Um, and it, I believe geographically it's measured out to 75K. Mm-hmm. But once you do the dance from the inland trail to the beach and back and forth, I think it's north of 80. So like just in a practical sense of how you move on the trail, um, I believe it's north of 80. I mean, I was 6K ahead before my watch died on me. And uh, and that was at the 55-ish K mark. So you were over. So I was, well, it's 80 and change. And every, you know, we're, 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 you know, talking about little distance here in the hairs, but when you're running 75K, you want people to say 80K. (laughs) 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 Because it's definitely 80, yeah. Um, The worst part's the south end of the trail. Terrain's awful, goes up and down, and it's ladders. It's not about the distance. The terrain is brutal. I was popping blisters and... And, and miserable for the last two hours. And, uh, uh, but you know what? Made it. You did it. Yeah. <laughs> Made it. I heard uh, you had a little bit of a scary situation <laughs> when you were uh, swimming over at the very end. Yeah, I should, I should have brought a paddleboard. I should have, <laughs> uh, I should have had a boat or I should have done something. I, I saw, now keep in mind, um, I do very little research into the things I do. And I, <laughs> I was going to ask what and, your game uh, was going <laughs> So I, 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 Talking about the full thing here, I, I brought my crappy camping gear to the north end of the trail because I didn't know if it was going to make it back. The bus driver gave him 20 bucks and he brought it back. But I was, my food for the day before was meat and cheese. I had some meat, steaks and cheese. And that was my day before food. <laughs> and then I had a bunch of running stuff. So basically I ate everything I had and because uh, I didn't want to carry a right, piece of right, meat right, running sure. across the West Coast Trail. Uh, get some bear bait there. Um and then I packed my uh, running pack with like 3,000, you know, uh, what do you call it? Calories worth of running food. How heavy was your pack? 15 pounds, which is too much. It's too much. If I could do it again, I'd do it with half that weight. 15 pounds. It, I left. I finished the trail having ate like a third of the food. Are you serious? Yeah. You were good on water? Just too I was much good food? on perfect amount of water. Yeah. Uh, I think it was, too, but I had, I brought like a couple beers with me too. And I had a couple beers at the stop. So, so I did have some, I could have gone with like one less beer. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I, I, like two liters of water and keep in mind, there's a couple stops along the way. And you know, if you have those things where you get water from streams, you can do that. I, I'm not one of those guys. Didn't want to have the aftermath if it happened. Um, but I, yeah, I, it was too heavy. It was too heavy. And I had, a, you know, battery chargers like for my phone that didn't even work. My phone, everything went out. <laughs> anyway, uh, elevated my confidence and my comfort zone after that one, Denny. There was a couple scares though, weren't there? I ran into a bear. Yeah. Uh, bear scared me a little bit. Yeah. He uh, stared me down and I was between him and the ocean, you know, so <laughs> that, but you know what? I, I'm a pretty seasoned bear wrestler. So I think I could have taken him. Like I had my little pocket knife and, you know, I've been watching MMA and jujitsu. So I'd go for like some sort of choke, probably, <laughs> probably choke and stab him with my two inch blade. <laughs> <laughs> I, he'd, he'd be, you know, I, I wasn't worried about the bear a little bit <laughs> other than the bear, just swimming across the damn river at the start. I saw the Gordon river the morning before it was low tide. It looked very swimmable. And at the end, um, so here's my strategy. Okay. Cause you know, <laughs> you're not watching the, you're watching the sun come down and you're moving slower by like my version of 75 K. So there's five kilometers less that left that last 5k at that point took me probably two hours because I'm moving slow. It's up and down. Every step hurts. And about, I want to say it was one or two kilometers out. I, uh, I, I basically, I knew that if I, 
sun's coming down. If there's no boat in the ocean that I can see, I got to swim. And, <laughs> and, and I'm thinking to myself, well, let's, let's uh, eat all the food that we want to need to eat now. Let's waterproof all the stuff in our pack that we need to waterproof now. And uh, when we hit that beach at the end, we're not going to, I'm not going to get changed and, and address my pack at that point. I'm going to hit the beach and run straight into the water. And so I, I, I basically waterproofed my stuff. I had an hour left to go. I hit the beach, no boats, didn't hesitate, ran right on the water. Probably the best thing I could have done because if I hesitated, I'd be sitting right, on that beach right, right. <laughs> for an extra night. <laughs> and I forgot how hard it would be to swim in shoes and a backpack and a hat and fully clothed. And so I was exhausted and poked my head up and I'm looking front and I'm looking back. And I'm like, oh, I'm halfway. I'm exhausted. Ah, so I had to like slow down the, str like the stroke and, and focus on the breathing. And I just calmed right down instead of trying to race across. And the tide's <laughs> taking me out to sea. And uh, <laughs> it, it, I caught a sandbar, which is at the lip of the river, right before it kind of goes out. I wasn't worried about going out there. I'd be fine. Uh, well, for 50 more meters at most. But, <laughs> uh, but I, I got to the sandbar and touched ground, dragged myself up on shore, felt amazing. Uh, took one selfie, turned my phone on, took one selfie, and then was started to just shake out of control, like a hy hypothermic, because it was like May and I'm swimming across the river. And uh, the sun was basically down at that point. And I'm, I'm at this Indian Reserve campsite that's supposed to close at nine, but it's like 8.15 or 8.30 and no one's there. And, but they, they had this loony shower system in the, in the showers. And I had one loony in my car and it was the best loony shower I've ever had. Yeah. And then I- well, That was the end right after the river. Right after the river, okay. selfie, run to the campsite because I'm shaking, get my camping gear. When I found out the office was closed, I went to go to the showers and I was like, a loony. I'm like, oh. And I, I, I thought, what if I don't have a loony? And I had a loony. Um, uh, and it was the most magical shower I've ever had in my life. <laughs> Did you eat that night? <laughs> no, I, you know, okay. So uh, after that, just picked a spot, uh, camp spot. Didn't pay, obviously, because no one's there. Set up my tent, uh, set up my cot, crushed, I think it was two liters of chocolate milk and passed out. <laughs> I didn't even have beers. I had celebratory beers to have. I had other food. I was so tired and exhausted. I just had chocolate milk and went out cold. And I, it, it was a painful sleep. Didn't sleep much. I mean, even after the one I did in Portugal just recently, you don't sleep much. You're in so much pain. Everything hurts that you're not sleeping through that very well. But, you know, it's temporary. <laughs> <laughs> what was the feeling like, I guess maybe the next morning because you were too exhausted and in pain to feel anything that night the body you know what when you're in kind of training mode leading up to those your body recovers surprisingly fast mm -hmm. so I, I actually felt decent the next day not that it would be perfect um like i wouldn't want to do it again <laughs> <laughs> but I, I felt pretty good i, I mean definitely sore the feet suck like the feet are sore there's blisters all over them i didn't you know i didn't even tend to my blisters by the time i got back there um, but pretty good. But I do remember that I was still in rough shape when I got back the next day. Cause I had these sketchy concrete guys working on my house and I, I had to help <laughs> them move concrete in a wheelbarrow. And I put my back out the next day <laughs> moving concrete for these sketchy guys. Um, so I put my back out two days after the race moving concrete, but the, if I didn't do that, I think I would have been pretty decent. Like, and by decent, I mean like two, three days till you feel normal. But even when you're not normal, you're not that bad. And by not that bad, I mean, you can walk. <laughs> yeah, I'd say, but you know, it's, it's, it, it, your body can recover quicker and better than you think you can when you get to that level. Not that I'm an expert. <laughs> so fast forward. Yeah. Was it a year? Yeah. Yeah. Between so that and Portugal? That built my confidence. Comfort zone expanded. Uh, and what I, I guess what I found after 2017, not doing anything, I, I, I wouldn't call it like depressed, but I just kind of felt like not as happy as I did when I had accomplished something physically. And then 2018 did the West Coast Trail. And I remember just being aware of my feelings after that. And I was the happiest man on the planet for a couple of months. That rode through a couple of months. And then come the fall, you know, you get back in your regular routine and then things kind of got a little bit flat. And then that's when the uh, Portugal thing came in. And I just said, let's, let's book a trip to Portugal. Let's, well, I was, I was looking for a trail. It just landed, happened to be Portugal. And uh, let's do something bigger. And at first I signed up for the 65 K race, which isn't bigger, but then I just, I couldn't let it go. I, I just, I kept on thinking about it. And then I just did the, one, did the 118. And uh, yeah, that was basically like West coast trail esque. West coast, but I'm in pain for six and a half more hours. 
So I couldn't say what, yeah, technically it's harder. Uh, technically the worst two hours of the West coast trail is extended by six and a half hours on the Portugal run, but it's safer. There's aid stations, there's people. And, uh, yeah, what I did it solo without a backup plan on the West Coast Trail. My backup plan was find the closest hiker and hope they will take care of you. <laughs> <laughs> no cell reception, nothing. No. Yeah, but the, yeah, the Portugal one, uh, basically, for those that don't know, I just came back from a trail race in Portugal in the Azores Islands, and it was 118 kilometers, 5680 meters elevation gain and loss, and uh, it took me 21 hours, 27 minutes. And, uh, I, I, I've never been in so much pain. And I said that last year after the West coast trail, this was more pain. This hurt more for a longer period of time, but I just felt safer. <laughs> now so, yeah. I obviously know the story, but did you intend to game plan better for this one? Not really. No, no. Um, <laughs> I did in a sense that I Googled the training routine on this one and I didn't for the last one. Uh, as I mentioned to you before, I, I Googled what ultra runners training schedule looks like. And I just took the Coles notes version of that and said, Oh yeah, you know, peak week. You know, I was just looking at the weekly runs up to the total. So I, like five minutes later, I had a rough plan in my head. <laughs> um, there was definitely some holes in my plan. Uh, it was not the best training. Uh, uh, th there, there's a lot of elevation. So the distance wasn't the killer for me. It was the up and down mm -hmm. and running a race in May. Uh, I, you know, I came off February, March, April training when there's snow on the mountains, I'm less likely to go up them. So I was running, most of my training was on flats or, or new Westminster Hills. And that's just not the same. So next time I do a race, it's going to be in the fall after hiking season. So I can spend months going up and down. That's, you know, lesson learned. Number one, uh, lesson number two, I went to Denver and trashed myself for a week for a beer, uh, <laughs> beer event. And I was abusive to my body and, and, and Denver had this like, um, pneumonia breakout this year and I was a victim of it. So I didn't realize this, but my peak training weeks were, you know, I felt like awful after Denver, like just my energy was gone. Like I just didn't know what was wrong, but I just kind of those let's tough it out, not go to a doctor type mentality. <laughs> uh, I had my peak training week. I did like a hundred K 120, 160 K in a week. I did, a, I did a seven day period with 160 kilometers in it. And that was while well, having pneumonia. And I didn't realize I had, I, I, at some point I, it might have been uh, my buddy Eric uh, or Jake that might have said you should get it checked out. And uh, I made a date where if I'm still feeling weird two Mondays before I leave for Portugal, go to the doctor. <laughs> uh, felt weird. Went to the doctor, found out I had pneumonia, had 10 days of the pills, got off of it, and then ran the race. Yeah. But, I, you know, everyone's worried, oh, pneumonia, it's going to affect you. Uh, it wasn't my bottleneck. My legs and knees were. So it might have been slightly better had I not had pneumonia. Um, but I, I, you know what, I, I, other than I, you know, I'm short, a little bit short on breath. The lungs weren't pulling like they normally do. My knees were just destroyed in that race. I met some superhuman freaks out there that have these chiseled legs and I'm a little bit of a juvenile compared to them. So I gotta, I gotta work on that. <laughs> yeah. Did you think about not going? No, no. I thought right. that I'm going to do it no matter what the goal for me was doing the training. The outcome of the race is whatever it can be. Anything can happen out there. Could roll an ankle, could twist the knee. I had achieved my goal when I ran that 160K in seven days, and I was fully willing to quit on the trail. So um, I don't have, yes, I am stubborn and willing to go through a lot of torture and pain, <laughs> but I'm, other than post swimming the river in the West Coast Trail, that was a safety wake up for me, and I don't have uh, any itch to kill myself. So, <laughs> so, or do permanent damage. So I, I was pretty thoughtful and thinking, yes, everything hurts, but no major injuries. I can tough through pain, blisters heal, split toes, split feet heal, uh, and everything else will be okay. So what was your confidence level on finishing after coming off of a few weeks? Of okay. Pneumonia? So let's talk about the highs and lows. Okay. Sure. Okay. I, I was running like a gazelle for the first six hours. I felt <laughs> I'm, I'm like with these, like I'm a trail runner. I'm in a European trail. Me and my Portuguese friends were all running through the hills. Uh, and I felt like one with them. And I was, I, I started off probably quicker than I should. And I didn't realize that you guys could follow me on the uh, website. Yeah. Um, so you probably saw I was like in 23rd, 24th, there's a hundred runners and I'm in the upper echelon of these freaks. And, um, <laughs> and so I was feeling pretty good. And then around seven, eight hours in, that's when you start hitting a low. Like I'm a good six, seven hour runner. 
by eight hours, everything starts hurting. Like everything hurts. Like your you name it, knees, blisters, legs. I mean, and then I realize I'm a third of the way there. So that's the low is when you are in pain everywhere and you're a third of the way there. Like if you ever do the, you know, gross grind in your outer shape and you see that quarter waist sign, that's yeah. discouraging. Yeah. For the ultra running version of that is eight hours deep, everything hurting. How did, how did you get over that? That's crazy. The ultimate mental game. So the challenge, Carl, and this is how sick you get over time, is <laughs> there's this sadistic reward about mentally forcing your body to move when your legs and body don't want to move. And I think it's, it's, we, we're all, we all can do more than we think we can. Um, I think there's limits to where you push your mind, but you know, your mind is a powerful, powerful thing. And, uh, old me in similar shape would not have completed this race, but knew me after my, I didn't even talk about the cold water swims and all that stuff. Um, <laughs> knew me has this mindset of, you know, uh, it, push yourself, you know, like see what you can do within reason. Like, and if you feel like a health problem's come and stop, but we can all do more than we think. So what the way that the pain was, it was all in my legs, heavily in my knees. My knees are good. It's just inflammation. I don't have any sort of issues with them. I knew it was just pure pain, not injury. So when you know it's pain and not injury, and you know the pneumonia is not affecting you, I felt confident, but just slowly staggering. Uh, the people though were so nice. So like, you know, there, there's this little island in the middle of the Azores. Everywhere you run, people are encouraging you. You have aid stations every two, three hours where you go into them feeling miserable and you come out of them feeling slightly less miserable. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then I found my friends, uh, like my, my friend was hard boiled eggs in that run. And it took me a few goes to figure that out. And hard boiled eggs somehow just gave me the energy to come back more than like all the other stuff. Like they had orange, everything, like platters of stuff. But I had, I want to say it was about 10-ish hours deep, um, 60K-ish in, I think it was where people at the aid station were thinking, oh, you, you shouldn't continue. How are you? Are okay? you serious? Really? Yeah. yeah. You, you, like, <laughs> like there, I had people that were genuinely worried about me. And, and then, um, but I bounced back from that and, uh, you know, you get a bunch of, you just load yourself up with food. Uh, fortunately my stomach wasn't hurting, which I saw some people as would, and you load yourself up with food and then the, <laughs> you get this surge back. The problem is the surge is energy, not better legs, you know? So I still have the same legs, but I have a little more energy. And uh, I, I started turning into a game where, because I was like aid station number five or six or something. <laughs> and I just started turning into a game about like, uh, they'd see me hobble in because I was not running like a gazelle by the time I'd run into these aid stations. And they'd ask how I'm doing. And I just kind of like try to make them laugh and, and do these jokes like, hey, what do you need? Are they like, new legs? You know, like, <laughs> you, know, it's, and they, you know, they're broken English for them. But um, uh, does it hurt? Oh, everything hurts. <laughs> you know, just like just playing up how, how much in pain I am. And I showed up, I think, at the next aid station with bamboo sticks to like take some pressure off my legs. Uh, they didn't work after that. They, they were not that great. Um, <laughs> Uh, I don't recommend bamboo sticks. <laughs> like as walking sticks? It's walking sticks, yeah. just to take a little pressure off when it's going downhill, mainly. Uh, psychologically, you maybe you're diverting the pain a little bit, but no, it was, it, it did not improve my game. <laughs> uh, but it became a game just having hilarious things to say when I'm struggling in and then walk, running out of there so slow because by the end of it, I was moving like a slug. <laughs> I had this volcano that was a thousand meters up at the hundred kilometer mark. So like 17 hours deep, you're going up this volcano. And I had made a wrong turn at the top of the volcano. And that was like my third wrong turn. And by the time you make a wrong, wrong turn after 17 hours, you want to just like cry, you're like melting down. And, um, but so I, I, even though my race was 118 K, I swear I run like 121 because <laughs> I made like three kilometers worth of wrong turns. Uh, <laughs> But coming down the volcano, I, I couldn't run straight or I couldn't even walk straight. I had to sidestep it down. That was the least pain. So I just rotated the sides. And I probably, I think I had like half a dozen runners past me going down. And I just had nothing left on the downs. But when it flattened out, I was okay. When we went uphill, it was okay. Just downhill, I just disintegrated my knees and I was just shot. And then I made 100K. And then I took a picture of that moment at 100K. That was a new record. And then I had, uh, had to go to the bathroom at 105K. And that was an hour after the 100k aid station and two hours before the next station. So <laughs> we're not talking about number one here, but it was a majestic Creek. It was the perfect setting, <laughs> you know, so, uh, you know, you do what you got to do. <laughs> do you think yeah. about not finishing ever? Mm. 
No, I, I kind of had to reframe the, the thought that the race is the goal. Yeah, it's a bonus if you finish. But if I didn't finish that race, the question is why? And it would probably be something out of my control or something that would affect my health in a bad way. Mm. So if, if I didn't finish because I quit because I'm in pain, yeah, I'd be, I'd be pissed about that. But if I didn't finish because I did legit, like a, a legit injury or something was out of whack and I just, uh, it was a health concern, I'd probably try to sleep on the trail for an hour and then give it another assess. But uh, if I didn't fit for, finish for legit reasons, no shame in that. Try again next year, you know? So um, yeah, I don't, it, the pressure's not on the finish. I just happen to finish because I'm stubborn. Hold on. We'll get to that. We'll yeah. get to that. Yeah. What was the feeling like as you crossed the finish oh, line? So happy, Denny. So happy. So happy. Uh, it was probably, so, that was probably uh, the greatest photo you've ever taken. In yeah, my opinion. I'd, I'd agree with that. Um, I would also like just, just a little thought on how the mind works, right? Yeah. Like you're, you're in pain the whole time. And they made us run over every mountain on these, uh, this island. Like you see the finish line and then they say, Oh, go run over those two mountains before you get there. <laughs> and, and so you, they, it's psychologically like just, it beats you down and you are running slow kilometers at the tail end of it. It is nothing like the start of the race. Um, and I saw the finish line about a kilometer out and you start hearing the music from it. You see all the people yelling and screaming and I'm in just as much pain as I've always been but it goes right away. You don't even think about it. You, you get this like adrenaline surge of happiness that comes through you. I even took a video, I think that moment, and and I think I said it, this kind of sums it up easy. Like the pain doesn't hurt when you see the finish line, you know, the, or the pain feels good when you see the finish line. I was, that's, what, that's what I said. I said, the pain feels good when you see the finish line. And uh, that, that applies to a lot of things, uh, but it felt good. And, and the bastards at the finish line were like yelling at me to run faster, which I was, <laughs> and I was trying to take a video. <laughs> so, so I'm like, okay, fine, I'll run faster. <laughs> but I, I'm glad I captured that moment. I'm glad I got the video uh, when I was going into it and the actual finishing moment. I mean, this is a life experience I'll never forget. So like that, the reward is one, doing it. Um, fortunately, my body held up. Uh, the sense of accomplishment when you do it is incredible. The people that are trail runners over there the volunteers, the everyone, in, incredibly nice. So many people stopped to make sure I was okay. At the volcano, I had a little moment where I was just had needed a rest. <laughs> and this Portuguese trail runner that could barely speak English stopped and waited for me for a bit. So the people are, are more concerned about your care than their time. And I had multiple volunteers run up and hug me at the finish line that thought I was in rough shape at their station. <laughs> That's and, awesome. That's and, so cool. And I mean, that. how do you not like love that? Like, so... Aside from the joy of finishing, having people take their time coming up and giving you a hug that you had met in pure misery two, five, six hours before. Um, I mean, that's, that's good for the soul. So, I, and, and I remember going into the first aid station, this kind of set the tone for it. You know, we're three hours deep or two hours deep, it's midnight. And we run to this little village community and the whole village community is like out front, like just cheering us on. We go from Pitchback Cow Farm to showing up in this little house in this little town and everyone's cheering their asses off and it felt so good so like the the you get a surge from from people cheering you on yeah. and uh when you finish you feel like a million bucks and you feel great because you just toughed it through um and then having the people so happy that are just volunteers are not tied to you that they're so happy to see you finish amazing you know you, you meet some cool people I, you know the ultra runners are different apples in a different way. We're all, we're all a little crazy. So I found that with <laughs> talking to us, some other crazy guys and we're all a little nuts in our own way. Yeah. We're chasing, chasing, I don't know what uh, some of them. I ran next to a guy that did a 300 kilometer run and that's, that's, that's another, I'm not there yet. <laughs> Do you sleep on that? Uh, you know what? Probably, but not like, you see not like, like you're talking power about. naps kind of thing, right? There's multiple. I mean, there's, there's, there's ones that are multi-day races that there's planned sleep mm -hmm. and there's, but th I think they have races upwards of 400 to 450 K now that are nonstop from start to finish. That being said, I'm sure the runners have like an 30 minute crash here or an hour or two there, but we're not talking about much sleep. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's a couple of good podcasts out there about some, I think the girl, I don't know her name. I'm going to, I don't know her name, but anyway, there was one that, uh, I think she did the Moab 240 and she slept for 30 minutes. I know exactly. Yeah. Won it by eight yeah. hours. And she even mm -hmm. fell asleep for like one minute or one, for minute. one time. And she yeah. felt amazing yeah. at, when yeah. she woke up. Yeah. One, one minute? minute made a difference. Something to Walt. Courtney DeWalt. Is yes. That yes. That Courtney sounds DeWalt, familiar. Yeah. yeah. So that was inspiring to hear. I, I mean, I also, um, 
who's the he can't hurt me guy, uh, David Goggins. Goggins. Yeah. I read his book and and just listening to him go through his stuff. I'm like, oh, sh-. that's when I decided, okay, 118 it is. <laughs> you know, so you get a little inspiration from different people. Mm-hmm. And uh, and you know what? The race was 118K. It was If it was 130 or 140, I probably would have still finished it. It would have just sucked more. Yeah. So what was the original question though, Dan? <laughs> I don't even know. I that was it. <laughs> yeah. Um, how long did that high last or is it still, I'm still on it. Yeah. Yeah. But it was, it was pure glory for a couple of days. Like I, the mistake I made was not, not, uh, take proper medication after I, I, uh, and what I mean by that is I took like ibuprofen three days after the race and it instantly, my knees felt instantly like, well, better by the, from morning to night. Mm-hmm. And after the race, I just, I'm in this little fishing village sort of tourist town I could have just gone over to a store and, and I could barely walk. So I just didn't go to the store. <laughs> um, I drank beers by the pool. And then day two, I thought I'll do it tomorrow. Didn't do it the next day. Drank beers by the pool. So I, I got lazy and didn't get the meds. So the first two days um, I could barely sleep. Like from, from the morning of the race to the, let's call it midnight. When I went to sleep after the race, I was, I was awake for like 40 hours. We'll say. And then that night I slept for three hours because I was in so much pain, every like rolling over was not an option. Leg being positioned one way, it, it, like certain legs couldn't move at night. Like I just couldn't move my body in my bed and everything was just this throbbing and, and it's hard to sleep through it. Um, and then the day two, I, I slept for probably four hours. So in a, like a four day, three night window, I think I had seven hours of sleep. And then I took the ibuprofen and then I was fast asleep. And, <laughs> and then my legs were a little better the next day. So lesson learned, these are little things you learn. Uh, but that was, that it was a, it was a rough recovery, but you know what, when you accomplish something that crazy, sleep doesn't matter. What three hours of sleep? Oh, I'm going to lose my energy next to the pool tomorrow. While I have beers and <laughs> stay off my feet. I did a lot of sauna and pool sessions the next day. Have you ever, have you had anything outside of fitness that has given you that same type of feeling? Uh, yeah, I'd say, uh, I mean, if in, in real estate, when I general contracted my first home and, and built that first home, I remember the, 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 the happiness I had when I got that final occupancy inspection <laughs> ticket passed. Cause it was like three inspections and they all picked out three different things. Uh, and that was a year of extra energy of my life and just an exhausting period of time. Um, I wouldn't say even though the reno I did in the house that I live now currently at, that was an exhausting year as well, but I, there was no real like determined finish line. So mm-hmm. it just kind of just merged into getting better, uh, uh, having kids, but it's a different sort of feeling like a sense of accomplishment to me, like in that way is you're going through suffering and, and a lot of work. And then you have this finish line and, uh, uh, there's not many, I, you know, I, I mentioned the stand up comedy, probably a house build. Um, you know, maybe first time I got into medallion or, or, or president's club for real estate, but it's a different sort of feeling because mm-hmm. it's not the same sort of suffering. Um, uh, but not, not, I, I, I can say that I will always want a fitness challenge in my life and I will always want different challenges that do different things for me in different avenues. So, you know, whether it's a real estate project or whether it's, um, you know, I do get a lot of reward for different things for coaching my, my kid, Caden, and, and I'll coach his brothers one day. Uh, different sort of things, uh, you know, that, that give you a sense of joy. But uh, a race joy is, I think everyone needs some physical suffering. We're, we're all too soft. You know, humans are soft now. We're, we need more, uh, we're built for survival. And I, I, I think we have it in us. And uh, I just, you'd be surprised at what you can do if you just kind of put your plan on paper and, and just... Don't look at the finish line of, I want to run a marathon. Look at the weekly action steps it takes to run that marathon and make those weekly goals the, the, fin- like the objective, not the, not the race. And if you can kind of rewire it so it's not such a black and white victory, you can enjoy the process too. When did you figure that out though? Because most people don't think that way. Most people, most people would assume that finishing the race is the mm. achievement, is the goal. Well, you know, you get, I think you get a little more self-aware over time and from not hitting goals and thinking that it, for me, goals, I'm a big goal guy. I could talk about goals for a long time. Um, but, uh, I think the, the right way to look at a goal is what you can control. Mm -hmm. And so I, like I said, finishing the race 
can't control that necessarily because if I didn't finish the race, there's likely a serious reason why. Um, but I can control the action steps it takes to get there. And um, enjoying the action steps and making those little mini goals along the way, the training runs, the, the weekly progress, uh, I think that's what is better to be goals. Because if, it's, if, you're, if your goal is the end and it's hit or miss, you're going to feel like shit and you, or you might give up halfway through. But if you had turned your goal into little, you know, weekly things or, or daily things, then, then it's, it's less pressure mm. to worry about the black and white finish or, or loss. And you know what? There's always another race. There's always another thing. And, and I, for me, I knew that if I didn't finish this, I'd still try it again next year or another time or try something harder. And the problem is I'm worried that I did finish it because the next one's going to be harder, <laughs> you know? So like, it's, I'm not going backwards. There's this hundred mile club I'm not in. And uh, that's got to be the next little threshold. So the, the real thing is, man, I don't want to be in that much pain next time. It was so painful. So uh, I'll probably take training a little more seriously to avoid the pain. And if I don't, I know I'm in for a world of pain. So, Do you look yeah. at the training as more of like a sacrifice to get to this goal? Or is it more of... <clears throat> I'm trying to enjoy running. Yeah. So I, I didn't enjoy running before. I wouldn't say I enjoyed it, but I think that's just kind of like a mindset of your perception. I mean, like, uh, do you want to, uh, I mean, no one really likes running on a treadmill, right? Like you're in a room, you're doing it for getting better, more healthy. But when you realize that, like, when you get over the hump where running goes from tough to easy and when it, well, not easy, it goes from painful to not hurting. <laughs> and then you get from hurting to slightly more efficient. And then you get more and more efficient over time where, uh, you, it, it just, it, it doesn't hurt. It becomes more effortless and it's more about just enjoying being outside. So for me, running is associated with being in nature mm -hmm. and getting my two dogs out there. And once you start, like, it's too easy to be negative. So once you just take that negativity out of your head and you realize you're outside, you're running on your two feet, you're in nature, you're lucky to be doing this. Um, why not? You know, why not push yourself for a season? I mean, all I, all I did was push myself for a season. Like, Three months. It was three months of training. The rest is baseline. So I'll like my baseline's pretty good though, because I hike with dogs, but it's not ultra running 118k good. And that mm -hmm. three month training was shit. <laughs> I, I could do it way better. So um I read some books on it. Uh Born to Run was one of them. And you know, you get David Goggins and you start realizing the mental benefits of running. You know, the the time that you just kind of maybe there's some, I don't know, meditative benefits, maybe it's some stress benefits. Maybe it's just the, once you start, you know, getting over the fact that your body, once your body stops hurting running, you just enjoy being outside. I think there's a real mental aspect that just helps you gain clarity and makes everything else feel easier in life. Mm -hmm. I mean, I knew that when I was training hard and I was doing my half marathons before 7 a.m. And, and that, that took discipline, but that discipline felt good because I was achieving my weekly goals and my daily goals. And then the rest of the day felt so easy, no matter what sort of stressful event might've been happening. What else are you doing outside of fitness to challenge yourself? <clears throat> and are those things providing the same types of benefits that you're getting out of the fitness stuff? Uh, I, 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 no, you can I talk don't about think the cold so. water thing. Okay. So yeah, <laughs> we, let's, we skipped over that. <laughs> um, I have a pool and I don't heat my pool in the winter time. And I was, I'm the type of, I like to go swimming. I like to go in the water like around last October. It started getting colder and colder. And then it just started becoming like this, this thing where I'm, I'm going in no matter how cold it is. And then I, but I'd post some stories on Instagram and I'd have people, you know, I had someone bring up Wim Hof and I looked them up. I'm like, Oh, cold water is a thing. You know, like this is, there's like benefits to this. And then people would just find it hilarious that I'd be going to my pool at like 6 AM in the morning in the dark. And it just became this thing where I was feeding off of, people, but also myself realizing like, this is how you start your day. <laughs> you, know? you are going to get up. And the first thing you're going to do is the worst part of your day. <laughs> and, um, there's nothing more, uh, scary and daunting than being half asleep and staring at your back basement door, knowing it's minus seven or minus eight outside. <laughs> there's a sheet of ice on your pool and you're going to try to stay in there as long as possible. Um, so yeah, terrifying. Uh, but I will say the cold water is not as painful as the hot water warming up. So I, what I found is I, my, in my peak of it, it was, 
it was minus eight and I stayed in the pool for seven minutes and there's like a sheet of ice in there. <laughs> and, and the mental uh, challenge is trying to avoid thinking about the pain. So I would really focus on my breath and, and, uh, and the breathing. And, you know, you can count to 100 breaths and that can take out five minutes if you're going slow. So that, that gets you there. Um, but I'd come out of that thing like an ice cube, like so cold. And I'd go in the hot tub and I would be frozen in the hot tub. And around the two minute mark, I'd start shaking because <laughs> I'm starting to come back. And wow. I would, that, this is the worst of it. Like this is when I was in the, like, the longest in there in the coldest weather. And I remember shaking until like eight, nine minutes in the hot tub. And that process around the five minute mark when the blood's warming up and everything's coming back, so painful, so painful. You know, I'm sure there might've been some damage. Well, I don't know if there's any damage or not, but uh, it hurt so bad before it hurt good. And the, the hot tub coming back to life was way more painful than being in the cold water, which is also very painful. But once I came back to life, I felt like a million bucks, you know, like 10 minutes deep in the hot tub. Oh, I'm gonna enjoy the next 10 minutes, watch the birds, sit back, relax, and enjoy my 10 minutes of peace because I went through the worst part of my day. And I, I, you, your body feels electric after it. Like you are energized like a thousand cups of coffee plus some serious drugs. Like it is, I would, I would be good till like one o'clock in the afternoon. After that, I'd start feeling normal, but energized for like six hours. And I, I'm going to do it again this year. And it's going to be, it's going to be rough. <laughs> it's going to be rough. <laughs> so that, that mentally helped me. Yeah. Uh, cause you know, doing stuff you don't want to do is, I think it's good for you. Yeah. Bad your comfort zone. Just make your head, make, make yourself go through the torture. Do you remember what you said to me in like January, February, whenever that coldest day was, when I asked you, why are you doing this? Oh, uh, was it something about, <laughs> there's something about the way your body feels when it thinks it's going to die. Yeah. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> <laughs> or the adrenaline your body yeah, produces when it thinks it's going to die. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like I, you're on the verge of death. Like I even Googled how long does it take to die in cold water just to make sure I wasn't like, I didn't know if I was like 20% to my death point, half there, 80% there. Like I wouldn't have, I don't want to go to 80% of my death point, but like I want to be like south of 50, you know? <laughs> so, but I think it depends on the body type. And I, I'm probably, I don't know. I think, I think it said you could be in there for 15 minutes before, but everyone's wired differently. But I imagine like when it's minus eight, that water's lower than freezing. And I imagine 50 minutes is the threshold. When I was in there for seven, it was painful. It was painful. Yeah, but probably had, it, probably had seven more in me before death. <laughs> <laughs> Do you understand that you are mentally stronger than most people? Yeah, I can see that. I see where you're coming from. We're all soft though. And I'm trying to dig into what we're... So your goal yeah. is to be less soft. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and it didn't start with, you know, keep in mind, it didn't just go straight to jumping in pools and like, there's a little, little mental, I've always been a polar bear swimmer. I've always, you know, uh, liked to work hard and challenge myself, but it's just taken a whole new level and, um, I'll probably be crazy for a few more years to come. And, and I think the running really got the reason, the real reason why uh, I started running is because I have dogs that need exercise. I also am well aware of my body type. And if there's any activity for this body type, that, that it would make sense. Two birds, one stone, dogs need to get out. You're built for running. You have a runner's body type. You're 35. You might as well run now. You're only going to get slower. And so, I, you know, there's a little bit of a time thing there where like, let's just see how, how much I can do over the next probably 10 years and uh, see how, how far we can push this thing. And, it's, and I'm not talking about doing it all. Like, I don't want to do it year round because it takes some time away from my kids and I feel bad about that. Um, but I do want to do one insane thing a year. So we'll see what next year brings. Do you yeah. think, I don't know exactly how to say this question. It just popped in my head. Do you think um, <clears throat> being an entrepreneur pushes you mentally or having this crazy mental toughness kind of built into you that you've developed push you into entrepreneurship? Oh, Because to be okay. an entrepreneur, to work for yourself, yeah. you, need to, <laughs> you need to be able to battle. Yes. Yes. There's a lot of downs, especially early on. You need to be good at failing. Yeah. And, um, I think, uh, there's a growth mindset and there's, um, and that's kind of like where, you know, you're not afraid to fail. You're not afraid to look like a fool. You're, you're not worried about what other people think as much. You're, you're, you recognize that effort equals outcome and, uh, you take failures as learning lessons instead of fail and walk away. So, um, where does that come? Probably, you know, I feel that we're all a little bit of a product of our environments. 
you know, so probably some parent, great parenting there. Um, probably a little bit in the DNA, <clears throat> probably a little bit from doing some fails early in life and finding out it's okay. Uh, probably a little bit from being, you know, just, just I mean, there's probably little fails that you don't think about as a kid and, and as a adolescent that prep you for this. But mm-hmm. my biggest preparation that I can pinpoint for entrepreneurship was when I ran a painting franchise when I was 17 and, uh, um, I made every mistake. I mean, I was 17 years old and I, and I employed, all my employees were older than me and it was the first summer of college. And I worked like a dog for that, the work ethic I had at that time. And I, you know, I wrecked people's roofs, had to replace a roof. I had my first month, I made no money on a job that I was on for a month. And I seized my van engine. So I was in the hole 3,500 bucks. And, and uh, what I found though, is I just never gave up and kept pushing. And so what creates that, you know, life experiences, maybe probably growth mindset, parenting, people that you hang around, uh, having some other failures in life that you came back from. And, and I left that summer having made like, I think it was 20 to 22,000 bucks. And that was more money than I ever, ever had up until that point as a 17 year old. And, uh, that ended up being, ended up being half a deposit for my first condo that I bought when I was 19. So at the end of the day, that snowballed me into real estate in some way that gave me the confidence of that. Hey, I can, I can be a, an entrepreneur, be a business owner. And then I did four more seasons of painting after that. And so when I went into real estate, I didn't have any real fear that I was going to make it. I knew I was going to make it. Um, I just didn't know how it was going to look like or what it was going to take. And, and the, the running a painting business really prepped me for that. It was a huge advantage that gave me a five year head start, uh, on, on being a business owner that most people don't get when they have, they go into this business. So I don't know what your original question was, but, (laughs) but that was, uh, entrepreneurs. I think it was like, what was entrepreneurs? Uh, ah. it's like, what comes first, the chicken or the egg, right? Yeah. What comes yeah. first, the entrepreneur or the crazy mental toughness that kind of pushes you into working for yourself? I think the mental toughness and, and, and entrepreneurs, you evolve, right? So I think it's little things early in life that grow into bigger things and bigger and bigger. Like once, like I said, my comfort zone is getting so big right now. Like the idea of doing a 200 kilometer race doesn't seem as crazy as it did two years ago, right? <laughs> so, um, when, when you, when you don't have a fixed mindset on what you can do or what you can accomplish, and you just feel that you can do anything within reason, um, depending on, and you work backwards on the realistic steps it takes to get there. Mm-hmm. So you put your dream on paper and that, but then you do a realistic action plan to get there. And then you ask yourself, can I do this? Am I going to go through those steps? And, um, and, and again, I go back to the goal, not being the outcome. Uh, if the goal should be going through those action steps to get there and, and the goal should be smaller. And, uh, if you're not a goal person, make them easy at the start and then gradually just develop the habit. The, the objective is to turn what might start as a goal or a new year's resolution into a habit. And if you make it hard and you fail at it, it doesn't become a habit. But if you achieve it, then you're starting the tone. I, I, I truly, I'm, I'm a product of good habits now is basically what I'm trying to say. And that comes from just trying things that start off as an experiment and then become habitual. I don't know. Did you, do you have any good like mentors early on? When you were 17, you started a painting franchise. Hmm. Was there anyone that, I guess more the root of the question is, was it completely internal in terms of you just figuring out that failures aren't that bad? You can learn from everything and get better. Or was it a book or like someone you saw on TV or I guess podcasts weren't really around then, but was it something external that you saw value in and learned from? Or was it more just going through the experiences and taking something away from everything? I don't know to answer your question on the mentor, no standout, you know, like, um, my dad has charm and wit. He's the reason why I try to be funny and make people laugh. (laughs) My mom is incredibly positive and I guess kind of, she embedded, you can do anything if you, you know, just work hard and you can, you know, there's no limits. So that, that is a positive dynamic to grow up in. But, um, I think my ambition, uh, started at a young age. I, I had a job early. Uh, I've always, I even have my friend's parents that I grew up with uh, tell me a couple of years ago that when I was like 
six or seven, I told him I wanted to be a businessman and make a lot of money. <laughs> you know? So, I, you know, I think in the early days, uh, it was probably a little bit of wanting to have an, uh, what my image of success was one day, which was freedom, a nice house, a nice car, even at a young age, because I, I lived in a good neighborhood and I saw that, but my, my dad made me think we were poor. <laughs> um, and we weren't, we were the, probably the least wealthy on the street, but it was, uh, he made me think we were dirt poor living in, in Buckingham Heights. <laughs> Can you look back and kind of appreciate that, that now? Do you, do you feel like that yeah, was better I, for you? I think that absolutely. If I was, if I grew up spoiled or, or if I grew up with things given to me, um, uh, I, I don't think I would be the same person. I wouldn't have that same fire. You know, I, I, I started working mm -hmm. at 14 and I went through a lot of jobs and then I got a car because that was my motivator back then. And then the motivator, um, since say college ish was probably just my vision of freedom. You know, I was going to sacrifice my twenties to get ahead and enjoy my thirties and, and, uh, and be free. Um, worked out, but you're never really free, <laughs> you know, so I'm still working. Uh, and it's not, and what I, you know, I've obviously realized that I don't want to not work. I just want work to be something that I'm passionate about that I enjoy. So it's, um, you evolve your expectations over time. I, I, I truly have everything and more than I ever thought I would. So I'm very grateful for it. And now it's just kind of about how do I do this dance moving forward? And that's probably part of the reason I'm grateful is why I got to torture myself in these long runs every once in a while. Uh, I, I, I don't know where to, I would say mentor. I've had a few that have had an impact for this and that. Um, but no strong mentor. I think a lot of it is internal. I think a lot of it is observing people that I admire for different reasons, observing things that I, that motivate me. Um, the ultimate motivator is I'm clearly an adventurer. I, I like freedom and I'm tied down with three kids and mortgages and businesses that anchor me. So my freedom, my, my escape is these little adventures. And, um, I'd like more of that in my life. Uh, I just don't know how that will look. Uh, but I think that was, that was my ultimate motivator. And, but now that I'm here, uh, I mean, there's a lot of motivators now it's, it's different. It's another level. I'm responsible for three young human beings and a happy family. And, uh, you know, parents get older, you got to appreciate the time with them. Appreciate I spend time with people you care about. Yeah. A lot of different, it's not all money anymore. I'm not materialistic. Like young 12 year old me was that wanted the big house and the fancy car. Everything for me now is not, is, is about purpose and what's the, what's the value behind it. Um, even though I do live in a nice neighborhood, but it's mainly my house, you know, my house, it's an outdoors paradise. <laughs> <laughs> it's designed to make three boys tired. <laughs> do you remember after the four years of painting, getting into real estate? Do you remember what those goals were that you would have written down? I, I, you that, mentioned briefly that <clears throat> the idea of freedom, mm -hmm. but was there any specifics? I don't think I was writing down goals at that time, mm. but I'm going to say that I probably had a goal in my first year. Once I knew that I was doing okay, um, I wanted to be a rookie of the year in the real estate board. And I was, I think, second place to Steve Gorey, which arguably- Were you probably, second place? Yeah, I was yeah. second place. I, my, you know, I, uh, we did around the same amount. I think he beat me by one, um, but I, I did a lot of off-market non-MLS points. So I don't know how many of them registered, uh, but I was runner-up. And arguably that might've fueled me a little more for the years after that. Um, and then after, after being runner up for rookie of the year, medallion was happened at the same time. So that was no longer a big deal. Then it was chase for president's club. And you know, at the end of the day though, like those are just status symbols, right? Mm -hmm. Like I, I, it means something when you come, when you don't have it and, and uh, you're not used to it and you, you, you want to have that feeling uh, of making this club, but it's not the same reward um, as, uh, things that mean something beyond status, if that makes sense. Things like, well, for me running uh, a longer race than you ever expected to making an income that supports a family gets, you, allows you to live where you want to live and gives you, reduces your risk and helps you get to freedom. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, my motivator now financially is to reduce my risk and, um, and then, uh, keep what I have, uh, in the short term reduce the risk, keep what I have. And then once I get through that, then bigger projects and bigger challenges, but less frequent. I don't want to get caught in the busy circle that I always put myself in. So I feel like I could accomplish more in less time by ha thinking bigger and doing it less frequently, if that makes sense. Is that something that you just have to go through and learn? Yeah. Cause <laughs> I think, <laughs> cause I feel like I consistently put myself in situations where 
I just feel busier than I should for the results that are happening. So I'm going to say yes. Yeah. I, I, obviously, I do it to myself too, and yeah. I keep shaking my head. Like, what the <laughs> fuck am I doing again? Um, the only exception to that is you get to watch me do it. So yeah. I'd like to hope that you're a little more wise because you've seen the stupid things that I do. You didn't put together the Craigslist cruise in the morning of the reno before you do like every morning when I was renovating my house, I'd get a mishmash of Craigslist people. I became an expert at hiring Craigslist people. Uh, I wouldn't know who's going to show up, but some, but I would, I went through, I think 22, 24 of them to get like three gems. And those three guys made the project go by that much better. But what I would do is I'd have this system of lining up Craigslist laborers give them a direction in the morning, go on, do my work, settle up with them in the afternoon. And uh, I don't recommend that for anybody. But I, uh, I, you know what? I learned something from it. I learned, you know, I, I, you develop, I think a big part of who I am today is by being fearless and blindly going into these things stupidly in a way. But I get so much out of them that I, I'm not even thinking about that makes you so much stronger and better at making the decisions in the future. So I, I'd like to, yes, I could, I'd probably reduce one or two projects off my plate, <laughs> but I, I'd like to think that I'm getting something out of it that's going to pay off eventually. I'm going to either one, have a bigger appreciation for not doing anything and enjoying that time off with the family and kids mm -hmm. or, or be more selective at the types of projects and types of ways that, you know, I'm, I'm I, I, where I spend my attention in business. You know, I, I see myself as, a project-based person. I see myself as a problem solver that fixes problems and makes businesses more efficient. And I see myself as a creator that starts things that people uh, want to run and grow. So what that looks like, who knows? How, who knows what 10 years from now will look like? I have no clue. I think obviously entrepreneurship has been very glorified in the last decade, but I think a lot of young people getting in don't understand, first of all, how much work it takes to build, but Second of all, from the get-go, they're talking about scale. How do I grow this? How is this going to be a billion-dollar company? <clears throat> Early on, do you have any advice for people in terms of, <clears throat> like, when is it time to scale and bring on people and grow versus, like, you need to just figure it out on your own? That's part of the process. Yeah, I, uh, advice. Okay, so, I'll, yes, I do. Or, or more yeah. just your yeah. experience and what you've done well yeah. versus what has not worked out. Let me, yeah, how would I do it differently if I did it again? Mm -hmm. That's probably a better way. The thing, my issue with advice is the people that give it freely, uh, it's a two-edged sword, right? Like, um, it, it could either, one, the person getting the advice could take it and it may not work out. There's mm -hmm. bitterness there. Or two, they um, uh, they don't do it and the person that gives it feels like, well, what am I I'm trying to help you and you're not listening. Mm -hmm. Um so the way advice that, maybe is a bad yeah, word, but more yeah. just like your experience and what's but working and what's I, not. I do like that you use advice because that's something that I think people need to be careful when they give. Mm -hmm. So I think that's important as a young entrepreneur, when you're getting advice, realize that someone, what I've found from really successful entrepreneurs, they're more likely to give advice through life experiences yeah. and they'll, they'll caution their advice as opposed to saying straight up, go do this. Yeah. Anyone that's saying go to this, take it, you know, take a step back and and take it for what it is. But um, uh, someone that's giving strong advice without recognizing your personality or the potential outcomes are not having a wide enough perspective of that impact of that advice, yeah. and it may not be the person you want to listen to. So, um, but regarding my personal thought is, um, develop good habits early. You know, so just have the energy to run a business. So, you know, aside from jumping into entrepreneurship, make sure that your, your sleep, your diet, your health, your, uh, your, your daily routine is in check in some way. You know, if you have high energy going through the day versus low energy going through the day, you're going to likely get more done. And, and so um, this is something I believe in more now, maybe I'm getting older and when you're younger, you don't have to worry about this too much, but <laughs> the earlier you get up, you're more productive in the morning. So start your mornings early, learn every spare chance you get, whether it's podcasts, audio books, whatever it is, when you're driving your car, you're learning about something you're, you, you, you're getting other people's perspective, other, other people's stories are learning about a field that you're not in. And if I could go back and spend more time learning in my earlier days, I think it would have been better at how to structure a business. And I, I winged it for like up until we partnered up. And even when we partnered up, I was winging it, but I, I winged it for so long and purely lived off hard work. And that's exhausting. And now I, all my energy is towards making sure the engine's running and the systems are fine tuned. And so it's a complete night and day switch. But um, 
I, I guess what I would say is be prepared to buckle down. Be prepared. There's, there's a time for balance. Uh, balance is a funny equation. There's a time for the work-life balance to be more work-heavy than life-heavy. Um, recognize when you're building a business and what those steps are like. Get inspiration for other people in those fields. Follow influencers in those fields. Read books. Read audio books. Listen to podcasts. Learn every chance you get. Pick people's brains that are doing it. And, um, and, and get more than one perspective. Like Get multiple perspectives. The, the more, uh, the older I get, the more I have a thirst for learning. Mm-hmm. And, and when you, the more, the more I learn, the more clear my decisions are and more clear the path is. So young entrepreneurs getting in, I, I'd say hustle. It, it, to me, it makes sense to scale up when you can, you're, when you're financially okay with the risk. I mean, it takes nuts to have a full-time staff member when you're living paycheck to paycheck. So, you know, step one is to hustle to build your financial cushion and then use that financial cushion to get you that first assistant to free up the time that's, that's, that's the least important time. Big believer in 80-20 rule, even more so in real estate. Um, so get rid of that 80% of your time that's not amounting to the big ticket items. And embrace hiring people. <clears throat> um, don't see it as a chore. See it as a challenge. The sooner you do that, the better off you'll be. A mistake I made. Um, Hire people, uh, recognize when they're working out, recognize when they're not, take it as a challenge of leadership and management. And um, if they fail, it's probably because you failed in some way. And so adjust, course correct, do it again. Adjust, course correct, do it again. Don't expect the first one to work out. But when you do have a good hire, your game is going to be elevated one more notch up. And then you're going to have a new baseline and your business is going to be at a different level. And you're going to free up some more, some of your time for the more important items. And then you do that again. And then you do that again. And then that's when you start doing things you never thought you'd do. So um, embrace, embracing people and recognizing that there are people that will elevate your business and there are people that will hold you back. And I've had people that I've worked with in the past that I just recognized after a while and I didn't cut it clean sooner that I'm working just as hard for less or it's just not elevating my game or not freeing up my time. So if it's not elevating my game and it's not freeing up my time, then what's the point? What's your experience been, or did you have a hard time early on when you first hired an assistant or had another agent working with you um, in terms of delegating and giving up control? Uh, yeah. There's been a few people that I've talked to recently who are at the level where they can grow, but they need other people to grow. They're just capped out personally. And their comments to me have been, I just want the experience to be phenomenal with every single client. So I don't know how to give up any of what I'm doing. I don't know how to let another person meet with a client that came to me. They got to get over it. (laughs) I mean, it's really, to me, it's straight, simple. Mm. Why worry about something you shouldn't worry about? Look at the, where you want to go. Look at where you want to be. You know, I, whether you're looking five years back, 10 years back, I really, I kind of look at my life deathbed back, you know, and how, and how those steps want to go. So where do you want to go and what are the steps that have to take place to get there? And if that means scaling up and leveraging on other people, you're going to have to do it. Mm-hmm. So what's the best approach to doing it? One, expect your first hire to fail. Learn where you can. So read some books, some audio books, podcasts, get some inspiration from people that are doing it. There's so much information out there, but you get, you get some outside aside perspective on tips for, you know, interviewing and looking for the personality that fits and all these little things. And, um, and you're going to fail <laughs> likely. Uh, and you readjust, you course, correct. You recognize that it was a failure. You let them go, you do it again, or, you know, you, there's another path, you know, everything, you, you can't worry about it when it's not happening. You, there's no point. So if you're worried about putting another realtor in front of your clients, get more clients, it'll sting less. You know, um, but I, I, my approach would be to learn on my spare time, get some inspiration, get some sort of plan in writing and do it and not expect for it to be the best. And once I do it, then have some sort of plan on onboarding and training that person and leading that person and have some things that, you know, some trigger points where, you know, if it's, whether it's a date or whether it's, you know, you're giving that person the same instruction five times or there's something that's just not working out or it feels like it's the wrong personality for the job, um, get some inspiration on, on, on maybe it's 
psychological testing or whatever it is. But uh, if you need, get some outside validation on your problem from someone that's doing it, mm-hmm. and the likely answer is that's not elevating your game. That's not making you better. Uh, it's not the right fit for that position. Is there another position for that person? If no, move on. I just, so my comment back to these, uh, I've had a, a couple of people say this to me recently is um, like, what's the goal? What What's the long-term goal? If, if the goal is to just be, have a business that makes this much money that you're making right now because you can't do any more physically possible, then be okay with that. But you're going to be a workaholic for the rest of your life because you're working 90 hours a week right now. Yeah. But there's a couple quotes that I come back to a lot that help me that I share with these people. One was from Mark Cuban and he said, uh, perfection is the enemy of profitability. And then the other one I heard from Gary Vee recently that was, um, Oh, he said, I'd rather lose a thousand uh, clients and scale than never lose a client and do everything myself. So he, he always talks about this. Uh, his, his business is like a thousand employees now, which is crazy. But he talks about this idea of, sure, I could do everything 110% and every client would absolutely love me, but it would be a <laughs> finite amount of people that I'd ever be working with. Whereas if I hire people and they're 80%, 87%, he uses all these different numbers, how many more, how much more can the business grow? How much more good can we do having a hundred people that do 80% great than me doing 110%. Oh, and I just like it. It's easy to understand once you hear someone say that, but as you're going through the motions, you think so short term in like you think about losing one client or, or, maybe not giving the optimal advice in every situation is such a short term, like one small thing versus long term providing phenomenal service to thousands rather than 10. And he, he, again, you just got to be good at failing. Yeah. You know, really that's what it comes down to. I, I guess from a realtor perspective, I think both you and I see it all the time. People partnering up for the sake of partnering up, yeah. people scared to make their first hire, um, to bring on the expense. Um, you got to be a big picture thinker and a lot of these partnerships and the way these teams are, they're probably awful working dynamics. Mm-hmm. I don't think realtors by nature, a lot of us are investing in, in, in learning about business systems, proper structure. I, I mean, I'm only been doing it last couple of years, so I've been kind of going blind up until then, but there's gotta be a reason to partner. There's gotta be complementary skill sets. There's a different personality for different roles within a company. And Gary Vee's nailed it. Like, and perfection is is a killer. You know, I spent way too much time on my first business card to <laughs> made an extra hundred cold calls. Um, and I, I I'm so good at that now, recognizing when I waste a minute. Uh, but yeah, I, I would say financially, I think there's a, a a comfort zone once you get to a certain financial level where you have a cushion. That's a logical time to make a leap. If you're a realtor and you're worried about another realtor being in front of your clients get over it or have a system where they're going to be in front of the new clients that you didn't have a past relationship with. And you have certain a clients that you maintain that relationship with have a blend or tag team with them. You know, there's ways around it. It's not kind of black or white. You know, there's, there's a lot of gray. There's a lot of little failures and you and I know that we've had some bad experiences in the past that some clients didn't have an experience they should have. Um, fortunately I can't think of many, but there definitely have been. And going through that, you don't want that to happen again. You get better at preventing that again. You get better at the people that you put in front of your clients, but you kind of have to experience those to really be motivated about it. And then you look back at your own personal experience and the reason that you are where you are today, or the reason that you are so efficient and good at your job is because you've gone through those failures. So if someone else that you bring on that is newer does never, never fails. They're never going to progress. You have to give them an opportunity. You to have fail. to, you yeah. have to, I mean, um, bringing on Rosa was the first, uh, slight game changer or game changer because we, you know, she was still learning and, and I was an awful leader, <laughs> but that, and then when we partnered up, uh, once you got it down and you were thrown in the fire pretty quick, uh, once you got it down, our, our game elevated and we took advantage of a, a good market, uh, more strategically, had I not partnered up with you and had Rose on board, um, I would have been burnt out and not been able to do the volume. And, um, and then now we've been burnt out for a few years and now we recognize the value of people. 
Mm -hmm. So we're focusing more of our attention on people and personally taking pay cuts because of it, because we see the long-term value. Mm -hmm. So we're get we've gotten over it because we recognize where we want to be. And um, if you, if you, if you write down and put it in front of your face, where you want to be and put down realistic action steps to get there, you know what you need to do. Just don't be blind to it. Mm -hmm. And don't like your mind will always find problems. They'll always find something to be negative about. But look for the positive twist in it. You know, don't say, oh, what if I hire the wrong person? My client has a bad experience. Then you'll get better at hiring the right person the next time. You'll know what not to hire. You know, you always got to spin it positively because there's no point being negative. When you look at it, there's zero point to it. Why not be positive? Why not be optimistic? That's how I live my life. (laughs) I love it. I think about that so consciously too. It's It's so easy to, I shouldn't say easy. For me, what I've found that I'm good at is going through a situation, pulling myself out of it and understanding, okay, I could react this way. It's likely not going to affect me very well. Or I could say, okay, I screwed up at this. I could have handled this conversation better. I could have said this. I could have been more prepared, whatever, whatever, whatever. And you're so much better the next time you encounter that situation. You're not, you're sleeping well at night. Exactly. You know, you're, you're, you're not dwelling on it. Yeah. And when you are dwelling on it now, you recognize you're dwelling on it. You recognize you have a mental issue about this and you need to work on that. Mm-hmm. Even for myself, certain things still bother me here and there, not nearly as much as it used to. But I recognize when my head's in a negative space now and I check myself. What are those trigger points? Why, why does this matter to me? I need to get over this better. Just, you know, it, and, and that comes with time and maturity and just self-awareness. And if you're in an open mindset, a growth mindset, not being fixed on, this is going to fail, I don't want to try. Mm-hmm. You know, you, yeah, there's probably some phenomenal realtors that have found the right balance of being a single army realtor. Um, I just haven't met them. <laughs> Everyone that I know that's a single army realtor is picking up their phone at every event that I see them at, at all times. I wouldn't be able to be the dad I am today. I wouldn't have the balance I have today. I wouldn't have run that Azores trail race had I not relied on other people to help me get here. And I would not be an owner of a brewery without having to be operating that brewery in the office every day. I, there was a time I delivered a keg, but that was, I was soon hired useless and I'm, I'm better I'm better spent away from the brewery than in it. I'll wreck it. Um, I'll drink too much. Uh, but my partner there, he kind of evolved into a great CEO, a great leader and recognizes his strengths and weaknesses and hired a good team around him. Um, you follow a similar path in a different way, you know, uh, sales a little different than beer, beer's more laid back, but, uh, you know, you had the best work ethic I've seen outside of myself and, um, challenge accepted, challenge accepted. Yeah. <laughs> we'll have a race to the death. <laughs> and, and even when we were in the busy years, Rosa was, she was crushing it too, but you know, we were a mess. We were all over the place. And, um, uh, but from a client perspective, you were the first person that I could partner up with where most of my clients that had you um, didn't call me saying, James, I don't want to work with Jenny. You know, <laughs> I, I, you know, there was a couple exceptions, but it was rare. And prior to that, it was frequent. And um, that had, I, had you not taken that leap and I not taken that leap, we wouldn't be where we are today. We are, we are genuinely in a win-win partnership. And, um, with both of us not feeling like, okay, uh, you know, energy and, and, and effort equal outcome. We're both focused on where we spend our energy, how much effort we put into it. And we know like long-term we're going to get there, Mm -hmm. but it's about enjoying the journey and, and there is no ending. (laughs) There is none. So uh, who knows what the ending is going to look like. But, um, when we get to the goal that we said, you know, say we want to do 250, 300 million in sales. When we get there, is that the ending? We just, oh. Go home now. Let's <laughs> no. go watch Lost. <laughs> no, no, it changes. It adapts. It, you know, you let other people uh, grow in the company and let them take on bigger roles or you grow the company bigger or you focus your energy on something different. You evolve. For me, I like change. So uh, I'm perfectly fine changing. Yeah. I'm excited. Hey, can I get a beer? <clears throat> yeah. What if I get a beer? I'll be really quick though. I was going to wrap can, up. Are you going to wrap up? Do you want to go? Oh, I got, yeah, I got time. Time. How long have we been going? An hour and a half? Uh, almost. Yeah. Around an hour 20. All right. Carl, what's your thought on the growth mindset? You have a lot of, a lot of good stuff. Where? Uh, Jamie has said. 
Jamie doesn't say very good, many good things. No, I, I kind of ramble on a little bit too. Like, so you get long tail answers to these things. Okay, uh, well, last well, thing no, that we no talked about tonight. Thing. This is going to be the last thing that you and Todd Talbot uh... <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> We're going to have this whole beard, Danny. Yeah. We're going to talk it out. Unless you have to run, Carl. Nope. No, I okay. am good. What we didn't realize about Todd is that I, I assumed he was on a fairly fixed time schedule. And we, so I, I cut the, I cut the podcast too. off at like an hour and a half and we continued to talk for three and a half more hours. We were here for a while. We were to like 11. We're just hanging out. Yeah. That's, That's good cool. stuff. Especially with a guy like that, mm-hmm. you know, he's, yeah. he's busy and doing things. Uh, do you know who your audience is mostly? Are there a lot of realtors that listen and, and just everybody and anyone or? So that's the difficult thing about podcast yeah. world is you don't like, it's very yeah. difficult to have to find that yeah. information. Do you see how many subscribe? You don't even see how many no, subscribers it, you have on iTunes. Yeah. You see downloads. Mm. You can see where they're coming from. Do you see ages? No, not really. Unless they have like a profile with, uh, I guess, the host of the podcast, then maybe. But because our biggest platform right now is Spl- is Spotify for downloads. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but you don't like. We don't know who they. Ha- can you find out who they're? Mm, mystery. It's tough. Yeah, it's tough. Yeah. So yeah. that was one of the things that we were talking to Todd about actually. After is that with Instagram, it's a lot easier to see who's following you. And what the typical demographic of your followers are. And so he was able to articulate that so quickly. And he was asking about podcasts and finding that out. And you're like, it's, it's difficult. You kind of need like, you can get social information on social media accounts. You, exactly. can, get, you can get some basic information from, uh, what are those things? Analytic, Google Analytics. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I guess it's a bit of a guessing game unless you... But on like a platform yeah. like Spotify or even iTunes you like people don't use their Instagram username as their name on Spotify. So it's difficult to track. Well, assuming that a lot of your audience is realtors or aspiring entrepreneurs (laughs) or single working their way up through life and trying to cheat this thing called life and make it a better (laughs) one. uh, A few things that we could probably go that I, that come to my mind that would be important things is just the, the people that maybe aren't in business and have entrepreneurial aspirations. I, I, uh, I feel there's a lot of ways in today's day and age of, uh, well, some things should stay a hobby and some things could be a business. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of way to, t- to test a concept and test yourself on a concept as opposed to jumping right into it. And so like, what I mean by that is like, you know, whether you're in business or not, if you have a strong passion about something, I, I always encourage young people to share their passion. You know, if I were a business owner and I had, uh, you know, uh, say, a, say I was, CEO of Steel and Oak for a moment, and I had a <laughs> I had a brewer apply for a job for me. That brewer had an Instagram account showing their love and passion for beer, mm-hmm. um, or even had an interest of any outdoors. <clears throat> like know that they have a personality towards something. That means a lot more to me than someone that's vanilla and just doesn't share what they're interested in or doesn't have something. And um, the idea, you know, people say oh, I have an idea. I think Gary Vee's probably said this. I'm sure a lot mm-hmm. of them. It's the, um, it's the implementation. It's the person behind it. Ideas rarely are meaningful. It's, it's, and ideas can change. And the world's full of change. So it, the, the, when you're getting into entrepreneurship or on your business, that's a question you have. Are you willing to sacrifice your balance in life for a period of time? Are you willing to self-learn on all your spare time so you recognize how to fix your problems? Are you a problem solver? Are you someone that is going to go through, that is going to fail well? Are you going to bounce back and course correct? Because my whole life has been fail, correct, go, fail, correct, go. And, and you make hopefully more good decisions than bad ones, but expect a lot of bad ones. And uh, it's, I think resilience is like the one word that is common about amongst all the successful entrepreneurs that I know. Mm-hmm. And when I, when I look at the craft beer industry and I'm not the only nut job in Jordan that has zero <laughs> background in beer and jumped into it. Uh, a lot of the breweries, owners that we know uh, didn't really have a strong background in beer. Um, they're, even though they're in what I call kind of a hipster, more easygoing, laid back industry, it is some of the best entrepreneurs that I know in that because they're dealing with so many moving parts, so many people, so many challenges. And they had to build a brewery and do all the, all the legwork leading up to that outside of running it. And, and I'm lucky to see more than one industry and and experience people's problems in more than one industry so that even though i have my little narrow life perspective which is getting wider uh I've, i feel like i've experienced so many other business owners and entrepreneurs experiences and and um I, every year that goes by 
I'm the smartest I've ever been. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I don't think that'll change. I, I mean, I have my little system of learning. I know you're into podcast, Denny. Carl, you a podcaster? Oh, yeah. yeah. Carl's huge in yeah. podcasts. That's what I like yeah. about podcasts, though, is that I get the opportunity to hear someone's experience who is involved in politics or a comedian or whatever. Other things that I'm likely never going to participate in, but I get to learn from their experiences in a completely different field. And the thing with podcasts is that it's real, right? Like it's the, the person's usually pretty authentic because it's hard to play a character on a podcast and you see like, you know, like the news cycle and all that stuff, people are just acting, right? It's all for show. Mm -hmm. Like the producers and all that have full control over you. Right. So like you can only make so many decisions. Yeah. I, I think I listened to a guy on Tim Ferriss podcast. I think it said it right. It's like, you get to be a fly in the wall with two experts talking about a topic that uh, you're really? interested in. Yeah. Um, you know, I know Gary V's one of your guys, Joe Rogan's, uh, and I listen to Gary V as well, but he's just got so much content. I, 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 I'd, be, to, I'd listen to more of it if I knew the gems. Yeah. If Tim Ferriss went through Gary V's content and pulled out the best parts, that would be <laughs> Tim Ferriss' good job of summarizing a lot of stuff. And then Joe Rogan's just entertaining yeah. and, and you get a lot of inspiration from him. But I mix it in. I do podcasts and then I, there's a topic like right now I'm trying to learn a lot more about nutrition. So, uh, uh, you know, I can't, I could probably find podcasts about it, but th that's where I'll turn down the entertainment and just go after a book that's that's an audio book usually or it could be anything but uh i mix it up mm. there's a time to be entertained and there's a time to buckle down and get deep on a topic and dan carlin's hardcore history is one of my favorites that's too. a great oh. podcast that is a great podcast yeah yeah big fan what is that one he uh it's like a super researched history podcast usually they're like five six hours and he releases like a, a few a year and they're and they're like it's all different topics. He only really does a few a year. Yeah, because it just takes so much research yeah, and time yeah. and all that stuff, right? He, um, yeah, he has a lot of good stuff like World War II insights. Like it's it's great, man. It's crazy. I, I even paid for his Raff of the Cons. Like I went to his website and paid for it like two bucks. Like it's not expensive. What it's great for a travel trip. Like you know what? Like <laughs> like they have the uh, Celtic Holocaust and the Raff of the Cons, and it's like call it thirteen hours or fourteen hours. Like we're talking long. But you are going to learn a chunk of history there. Yeah. And I never, you know, paid much attention to history prior to it. And now I'm super interested, interested in it. So, you know, there's going to be a time in my life where I'm going to go on a history binge. And even though I got a couple little glimpses down, I never remember the names <laughs> of the people. But I get the gist. A lot of murder back then. <laughs> a lot of awful things that happened. But what I found in, in learning more about history and, and anthropology and how we've kind of evolved into this thing is there is some dark, dark bad things that we've done in the past and it gets you like we are living in the best time of history like humanity is a blip mm -hmm. of you know what 200,000 years for humans and and uh, there's a blink of the eye uh from how long whatever this planet's been around and so I'll, I'll, i think a lot of the way i live my life is just realizing that when you look at everything we don't matter nothing matters we're a blink in history and so you might as well make it a good one you know you got one go and so that's a bit of the yellow. Is that no? Is that yellow? <laughs> yeah, that kind yellow? of. Yeah, that's what I think about when I'm on the top of a mountain. I like. Uh, well, I like. I describe it as perspective. So I like sit on top of Seymour, look down at Greater Vancouver. You can see millions of cars, hundreds of thousands of cars going by. You hear like a, just a tiny, tiny noise of the Little. city, mm -hmm. but you, and then like <laughs> millions of trees, and you realize how insignificant you are. And for some reason, that is like super freeing to me. I, I, it makes I, my problems seem so small. I know exactly what you mean, yeah. as you know. <laughs> it's, so, it's, it's so cool. That's that, why I love going, being up there. It's, there's things that you can't describe that it's doing to you, but you just know it's good yeah. for you and you feel better with it and it's better being in your life. But I do think there is a balance. Like if you did it every day, that's great. If you're at that stage of your life, would do it every day. But if you're at our stage of life, we're trying to hustle. Mm -hmm. Doing it every day is going to become... It, you don't want to turn it into, there's a, there's a balance of pleasure, yeah. you know, uh, I will say, um, you know, I, I've done most of these mountaintops here and I, I have my list for the year of my favorite ones that I got to hit and some that I haven't before. But when you get deep, the decimals, the ambient sound is so quiet that I, you can, like, I, I was the other, I did a hike, I don't know, a few months ago and it's just dead air, no wind. So when there's no wind, dead air, and there's a bird flying above you. And I'm not talking like a big bird. Like, I don't know what kind of bird it was. Maybe a 
I don't even want to say <laughs> Robin <laughs> Falcon. No, uh, but I could hear the wing, wings flap and it's like probably 50, hundred meters away. And you can hear the air from the wing. And if that exists in the city, there's no chance you'd hear that. And yeah. And when you're on like uh, one of those golf islands that's remote, you hear the waves, the little tiny waves crashing against the rocks mm-hmm. when it's that quiet, it's so peaceful and enjoyable. I want more nature in my life moving forward. So that's kind of that's the motivator. Yeah. You I was be, in Tofino last weekend. Yeah. We were at a beach. There was a few people on it, but you could, I'd say the tide was out like 200 meters. Like it was a long way out. You could hear like just the crashing of the waves and you didn't hear anything else. It's so peaceful. You know, it's beautiful. Yeah. West Coast Trail's just as beautiful. Wow. Dude, we're doing it in September. <laughs> Are you? Yeah. Running me, it, I assume. Me, no. One day, yeah. swimming across the river. You can 12 hours. <laughs> <laughs> What's the record? Well, I, I think someone did 11. 11? Yeah. 11. Yeah. But like you have to time like the boats up perfectly and everything. Uh, I missed the first ferry. Yeah. Yeah. Like I got up at 430 and by the time I packed up my site and got to the trailhead, it was 530. So it was like an hour of rituals <laughs> and packing up. And then I ran and I missed that first boat by like 15 minutes, but I had to wait for it for like 40 minutes. Uh, so don't miss the first boat if you're running the West Coast Trail. That's Carl's, do, Carl's getting into overnight camp, uh, uh, hiking country this week, so. camping this year. Yeah. Yeah. I'm yeah. so excited. I would. Uh, a couple days ago, we, we went up to St. Mark's. Yeah. The hike. Beautiful. And there was just like a few camping spots and it looks so nice. I just can't wait. Can't wait. It's populated now, though. That one's popular. It's a little too popular. Yeah. It is. Uh, if you but, but if you keep going a little bit further, there's more mountains. Unnecessary mountain. Yes, you got lions. That's the one. Yep. You got Brunswick. Uh, Brunswick. Um, and then there's a couple that are just Harvey. Harvey's out there. That's less traveled. Yeah. yeah one yeah. of the ones on my list is I want to do Cypress to Porto Cove. So the whole and track. the whole thing. Yeah. And uh, probably hit a few peaks along the way. Mm-hmm. I have uh, Mount Bishop on my list, okay. which is behind Seymour. Yeah. But I want to hit the Seymour peaks and do like a five peak day. Ooh. And uh, I've never done Evans, but I've done uh, Golden Ears. Um, those are huge. So you've been to the top of Golden Ears? Yeah. That's the one thing I want to do this summer. Yeah, it's a big one. Yeah. Do, save that for the end. Save okay. that as the cherry on top. Okay. Yeah. Um, my favorite, though, if you haven't done it, is probably Coliseum Mountain. Coliseum Mountain, yeah, eh? Where's it, that? It's, it's up mm-hmm. Lynn Valley. Um, here's my requirements for my hike rating list. Okay. One is it's three categories. Simple. Epic view. Less traveled and dogs and swimming hole. Oh, swimming hole. Ep- epic swimming hole, epic view, less traveled, mm-hmm. epic swimming hole. And uh, Coliseum's got this like glacial pond at the top, and it's less traveled. You can tell it's less traveled, although it, everything's more traveled in this Instagram world. Um, <laughs> but it's less traveled, it's got incredible views. Uh, it's a hall, but you got this little glacier swimming hole that's carved out of rock at the top, and it's a good one. And I hope, m- m- well how many listeners are going <laughs> to it stays less traveled, but it's probably going to be slightly more prop, uh, popular. Um, but there's, uh, yeah, I only do stuff that dogs are allowed on. Like my favorite one locally is white rock out by Bunsen Lake. It's just a simple one. Uh, I think it's one of the better peaks that are less traveled and, and uh, accessible. Like I, when I go at a good click, I'll get to the top in an hour. It's not that bad, but if it's probably trail rated for, I don't know, six hours round trip or something like that. Do your uh, dogs keep up with you? No problem. Yes and no. Sometimes. <laughs> yeah. So they, they don't know how long we're going for at the start. Right, right, so right. Squirrel. Uh, let's get squirrel. So they're like doing double the time. Like they're back and forth at the start. When I go for a big one, they're trailing me and following me to the car at the end. Uh, but if a squirrel ran by, they just jet after that squirrel. So they, they, they reserve some in the tank. Uh, <laughs> if it's open air and there's nothing blocking the sun, they get, you know, heat too much heat. But uh, when I was training, they couldn't keep up. I had to leave them inside for a few of them. Uh, they're eight and five now, so they're past their prime. Uh, but they can they can do a they can do a twenty thirty k hike if there's trees and water here and there and a uh, couple breaks. Yeah, yeah, yeah a couple breaks. It's, that's why I got two dogs. <laughs> no bear sightings. They don't. There's too much of us. Right, right, there's right. Too much of us. No yeah. cougars. None of that stuff. eh? Not yet. Although. They they're out there. They just they know you're there. <laughs> I would like to take down a cougar though at one point. I get my Swiss Army knife out. And I think I use my jujitsu. And have you you've hiked yeah. a lot more than me? Have you ever had a scare like that? I've. Do you prepare in any way for that? I used to. Should used to I? have bear spray, <laughs> uh, a blanket, uh, a, a knife, and all this stuff. And then like probably around the thousand thousandth. <laughs> 
hike. I can't get the pronunciation there. Um, yeah, I just, I just, I, I mean, I'll, I'll bring some extra stuff if I go big, but it, like I used to bring extra stuff if I do like Mount Seymour's first peak. Hmm. No, no chance. Now. Do you know, like bear attacks? Cougar attacks are so rare. I think since like 1988, there's been like 27 deaths in BC from bears or something like that. Yeah. Or yeah. immediately really entire North America. You don't want to be 28 America. though. Pardon me? You don't want to be 28. No, it, I know. But there's I'm, no point worrying about it, guys. You might as well just go into it thinking you're gonna just take out that bear. You're gonna you're gonna you're gonna wrestle it to the ground. But put on some sort of choke. Yeah, some sort of choke. <laughs> Get your little Swiss Army knife out, or if you don't, find the closest rock. But have a strategy. Like I, you know, I, I know what my reaction. I'm gonna be looking for a rock, and I'm gonna be going after that bear, and I'm gonna be chasing it away. <laughs> you know, so no point worrying about it. Might as well just think I got this. There you go. Confidence, confidence, Carl. You'd make a great bear wrestler with that reach. <laughs> Just go under the first mall, right? Yeah. You underestimate your abilities. Joke? You know, you, you really, I mean, no, I, I believe I, that. I'd be yeah. terrified. I mean, I've seen some videos of bears chasing bears. Do you see that video of the grizzly bear chasing the black bear up that tree? Oh my God. They're fast. There's no ride. Fast, what do you though. do? Dig a hole? They can dig too. They can do everything better than you. You're dead. Um, <laughs> For the more conservative hiker, would you suggest bringing bear spray? No. Is that going to do anything? Some of these hikes are so popular. There's no way there's no. any Only bears, if you're going bears deep. nearby. If yeah. you're going deep, I I've get seen that. a couple bears on the regular Seymour hike, though. There's one on the trail. I think most people are, would be so terrified that even if they had bear spray, the odds yeah. of them using it appropriately and yeah. winning that battle. I feel like those bears yeah. that you see kind of like get yeah. used to humans over a while and just hang out there all the time. So it's probably the same bear. <laughs> Fair enough. I've seen a bear once or twice <clears throat> from a distance. I mean, I'd be concerned if I came across a mom and her cubs for sure. And if I lived in Whistler, I'd be a lot more nervous about it. But there's just not a lot of wildlife on these coastal like Vancouver mountains. There, I just, I've been out there so many times. You don't see much. They might exist, but nothing like Whistler. I'd be nervous in Whistler. Whistler, eh? Yeah. You think there's way more bears up yeah, there? I think so. Yeah. 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 yeah big ones too. For far yeah, I don't know if I can take the those ones. I wouldn't have the confidence up there. Like, I have confidence, but I know I'm not going to run into a bear. But if I was like in a bear zone, like Alaska, no confidence. What's the weight limit here? <laughs> I think I could take out a, you know, it depends on a uh, few factors. The shape and size of the rocks that I have at access. If I can make a spear out of something <laughs> close by, uh, you know, maybe in my best day with the right move and connecting on that first throw, five, 600 pounds. If I get that first throw right on the shell, right on the dart, I think five, 600 pounds. If not, if I miss it, don't have any weapons, it's got to be 150 pound cub. Like it's got to be a little, little thing. It's got to not know how to fight. And, uh, I just, you know, I just hope that I can kick it in the head before it gets to me. I hope this does not become one of your challenges in the future. Uh, you know, I, I don't choose. They choose. They'll find me. They know where I'm bears. If you're listening. <laughs> Didn't Jackie Moon do this? Dude, I don't know. At halftime uh, of a Flint Tropics game. Oh, did he? Yeah, that would be you, amazing. If he you did. fought a bear. Yeah. You don't remember this? Yeah. In uh, know, the Will Ferrell movie, yeah, 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 he fought a bear. <laughs> you don't remember? <laughs> he had a safe word, and like the bell goes off, ding, 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 and he's yelling the safe word. <laughs> like right immediately. Let me ask you something, Denny. You're right, doing hear. hiking. You're doing running. Are you ever going to do a race? Uh, currently, zero desire. Zero. I, I haven't really thought about it. Exercise for me is my one hour per day that I get to turn my brain off. Not necessarily that I turn my brain off. I, it's more just like a solitude hour where I just get to kind of think. Yep. No, hundred percent. So it's like a meditation for you, essentially. I think so. So it's a little bit of physical and, but it's probably mostly your mindset. Yeah. I can't sit still. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know if I would be very good or if I could even keep to a schedule of meditation. Yeah. But I can keep to a schedule of working out for an hour a day. And it, it doesn't even become an option for you at this point because you've been doing it so much, right? It just becomes second well, And nature. I've told Instagram and the podcast that I'm doing it every day for 2019. Yeah. So it's accountable. not an option. <laughs> yeah. That's, you know, that's one of like, there you go. Goals 101 right exactly. there. Say it out loud. Say it to everybody. You're more likely to do it. Exactly. Shout it to the world. Yeah. You know, you don't want to, it just holds you accountable. Find people that will keep you accountable. Mm -hmm. um, do you get the kick out of, you know, the, those big sense of accomplishments? Do you think that might be in a different avenue of any sort? What motivates you, Denny? I'm trying to think of if I've had a big, accomp like a huge accomplishment. Well, sorry, maybe, I mean, you've been really work focused for the last few years and, and still right. are just dialing your routine a little much better, much better balance than before. Right. But that routine next year, year after, there might be a void there. For sure. What do you think is going to fill that void? <laughs> I think I'll figure it out as I go. I don't, I don't know. 
I've thought about it a little bit and I don't, yeah, I don't know. I like traveling. I think travel could be a bit of a void filler. Yeah. Yeah. Just experiencing more. Cause I feel like I had a pretty sheltered life growing up. So more just like understanding how different people in different parts of the world live. Cause so far I've been to throughout North America, been once to Europe and Barbados, which was different. Yeah. Well, so I haven't been to like a Thailand or even like where culture is so different in Japan or China. So I think travel. There's a lot of world out there to see, man. For sure. You realize when I was on in Portugal, I realized how little I've seen compared to these travelers that they, cause I stayed at a hostel for a few nights and I would highly recommend that anyone like I'm a father of three that lives in a good neighborhood. I need to, <laughs> <laughs> I need to, I need to slum it amongst my people for a little bit. And, and I, I the thing about hostels, I, you know, I don't get me wrong. I like the fancy hotel with a nice pool too. It's nice to have a little balance of both. You know, you sit back in a nice pool. Um, but in hostels, as opposed to hotels, you're more likely to talk to people. So, you know, I, totally. my and wife, people Daniel, are probably more yeah. open to talking to you. Everyone's open. Yeah. They're there for that. There's that crowd. Mm-hmm. And, and, and Except I, Except for that group of 16 year old girls. Yeah. They were really mean to me, man. They didn't even <laughs> Did care. you hear this story? Wait, you yeah. know what happened? Oh, no, just, I mean, this is a minor detail. I, 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 I don't, I hate to focus on the negative here. I had a great trip in Portugal, but there was a hostel yeah. where I was working, doing my work yep. by myself. I think you and I were texting, I, we were texting back, back, and, back and, forth and forth about something. And then yeah. it just... A bunch of girls slowly congregate in this room that I'm working in. And eventually they, five of them sit down at my table and then they ask me to leave. <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> what? <they're, laughs> and what it was is it's like basically like a school. And it was like, I think uh, maybe, I don't know. Like, I can't tell the age. Like they could have been anywhere from 14 to 27. That's, that's my. <laughs> <laughs> Keep it safe. <laughs> Somewhere in between 14 and 27. If I were to guess, I'm going to say 17. Ish. To 27. I don't know. 14 to 27. Uh, and uh, yeah, they were there for obviously like some sort of class or group uh, escape uh, event. And they're, they don't have proper manners and they don't recognize that first come, first serve. I had so my bad. table. I had my table. I thought I was going to be part of the group. I was excited. I'm like, <laughs> hey, I'm at a hostel. We're ready to chat. Uh, no, love staying at hostels. Love mm-hmm. the people I met there. You get recommendations on where to go next. And I got this list of like, I'm not, I'm not going to be traveling much in my foreseeable future, but Diane has given me one, well, I get one go, one go a year. So <laughs> the problem with doing a big trail race on that trip is you can't move for a couple of days after it. Right. But I feel like once a year, I'll go on some epic adventure of some sort of combination of nature and hostels and, and potentially a long run and, or kite surfing or something like that. <laughs> and, and that's, that's my like, little freedom nugget uh, once a year. So I don't know what next year's going to be, but it'll be something cool. I think that would be more my thing is I'm obsessed with views. So I think it would be traveling to places doing hikes. Yeah. Maybe they're long hikes. I don't know, but it, I don't know if the 118. No, you don't have to do it a race. I think run is my thing. I, I would say doing an experience like a multi-day hike would yeah. probably be more enjoyable and more yeah. rewarding. I less painful. Uh, less painful. <laughs> I would start there. Yeah. Um, I hope to do one of those one day. I just, where do you pick? Yeah. I mean, we're in a big world. We're in a cool place too. There's uh, a lot of things to do. A lot of things to see here. Yeah. I just would recommend leaving our awful weather for somewhere else's good weather and not totally. leaving our epic BC dunes. And I can't believe people that go to Maui this time of year, Hawaii. It's just, why would you leave this? Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. Just give it a few more years to global yeah. warming. Well, Carl, how about you? Are you going to do a big race anytime soon? Races? No, I've never, ever been into long distance running. Okay. Because I guess like growing up playing basketball, it's kind of sprint and stop and kind of, but long distance mm-hmm. I've never, never gone into. How, uh, how are you? Are, are, I mean, I know I, this has changed on the topic here a little bit because I have no racing to talk to you guys about. You <laughs> both of you have no passion for racing. <laughs> um, you talked about goals briefly. Mm-hmm. I've heard you talk about it on the podcast before, Denny. I don't know, uh, Carl, if you do this, but what are your what are goals to you? What are goals? Yeah, what do you do? Like, what are your goals? Like, how do you set them? How do you, you know, I, I have so many different philosophies about goals mm-hmm. and uh, with the end goal being either a cool experience or a habit change. But um, how do you look at them? Or what, what do you, do you have goals outside of business? And obviously running every day. Uh, you put, mm-hmm. But do you... It's how do you classify? So I think that's part of the problem in my life right now is that 
most of my life is business oriented. Yeah. So I could say I have podcast goals. I have real estate goals. I have some fitness goals, but outside of that little. So immediately when you said outside of business, I thought podcast, but then I was like, well, that's kind it's of, sort of work too. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's yeah. fun for me. Do you write them down? No, usually I'm pretty loose. So yeah. I guess, well, write down, I say them on Instagram. So that's kind of writing them down. I think you'll appreciate it if you start writing them down because you, what you're going to find is they get a little gray and hazy over time. And it's nice to know what they started as because mm-hmm. what I've found is the way that I set goals and uh, from the start, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be as aware to adjust my goals if they weren't written set in stone. Like if I wrote them down, one, you're more likely to achieve them. Two, if you don't hit them, you're still going to see them there. And, 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 you get better at setting goals down the road. And mm-hmm. it's, and I, you know, you go, it's easy to have like the one big audacious goal of like, here's what I want to do this year. But if you can kind of, when you hear me take the goal from. I made a note on my phone, 2019 goal. So oh, I did write yeah. it down. So it's good. To, like, it's good to go back at that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, but then, you know, like uh, goals can be a bit discouraging when you don't achieve them. Right. And mm-hmm. you know, that's kind of why I've kind of rewired myself a little bit to like think of the, action steps as the goal right um, but it's not that doesn't mean i don't want to write down the end goal mm. it's like you write down the big things mm. then you write down the action steps to get there and then it, you just decide over time you kind of evolve so for me i have this ridiculous like new year's resolution note that goes through like it'll have 40 items in it and i'll get through probably 70 percent of them um uh and then I'll recognize the fault that I made. Obviously, I couldn't control that or that didn't happen. I, I just stopped putting effort into that one or whatever it was. Mm-hmm. Because you could start on this, you could write down this, and you could decide halfway through the year, no, not for me. Um, so I've evolved. And, and what I do now is, I, well, I still have that list, that re- resolution list that's long. Um, but I've also created monthly resolutions. And, uh, you know, the seasonal challenges in a way, like, you know, running season and, and different things. And then uh, I have the week, you know, so the week I, I write down at the start of every week what I want to accomplish that week. And I, I even go so far as, uh, you know, in my, like I use, I went back to this big paper planner thing and I use a combination of Google and everything for planning my life. But um, I even go to as far as to, they have the month section and the week section. So in the month section, I write down three things that I want to focus on. One will be something for my house. One will be something for work. And one will be something for me personally, just because I got I have loose ends of the house that I need to finish. And I believe in making home comfortable. Um, so I'll put three things there. So I'm more likely to do them <laughs> if I write them down. And then yeah. I'll also write, oh, it's June because we live in such a seasonal world. I'll, I'll do like, I'll just take out a week in that month calendar and write down what my dream week would look like. So it's kind of like, here's, you know, I'm in June now, you know, because if you wrote, if you're right in October, you're not in October. Uh, I'm in June now. What would next week look like if it was my dream week and I can control when I work and when I don't work? So I just write that down and put that on the calendar. And it doesn't happen. It's just, it's just more about like, what is the optimal life work balance at this time of the year with your head the way that it is right now? Mm-hmm. And so what I've just found is, it, yes, I have my list of New Year's resolutions and long list of goals in Google Keep. I have my <laughs> weekly planner that has my list of goals for that week. I have my mm. monthly section of that planner that has the three items that I want to accomplish that month. And, uh, and then what my dream week looks like. And then every morning I look at, I start with doing the most important tasks first and look at what the most important items are every day. And I do not accomplish nearly like even close to all these goals. It's, it's a lot of them fail, but when you, you know, you, you, it just, I, I, it helps me. It helps me know that I'm making forward progress because it didn't go from zero to here <laughs> like that. <laughs> didn't go to zero to here overnight. <laughs> it is through little incremental wins along the way. And, and, and for me, the ultimate goal with right now, it's like nutrition it, before it was running a race is to get better at it, learn something new and um, make a goal that turns into a habit change that will be with me for the rest of my life. Do you feel like writing it down helps you be more accountable? Yes. 100%, right? Yes. Writing it down, telling people. Um, what's, yeah. the, what's the smallest goal you might have written down in like the last little bit? Smallest goal? 
go through my paperwork, like my receipts. Okay. <laughs> so, so it doesn't have to, it just piles up. It sounds small, it doesn't but have to be crazy. extremely yeah. daunting. Yeah. Carl. And guess what I did before I got here? Went through my receipts. Um, yeah, small goals can be as small as you want them. You know, like um, I'm, I'm not uh, like I eat better than I used to, but I am, you know, every. I have this desire to learn, uh, not like be an expert of anything, but get enough to have clarity on how I want to live my, you know, what, my health, like routine, my nutrition routine, my learn, like um, I'm getting more clarity on how I want to get to the point where I have clarity on what to do there. Cause I have <clears throat> three boys and, and, and obviously a, a circle of friends and people that like and watch what I do. And, but mainly because of my three boys, if I can make a habit change for myself, um, I'll experiment with that. And if it works out and I get a lot of gain from it, I can like, I, I pass that on to my children and I'm not going to, you know, be the types that tell them what to do. I'm, uh, but I'm their dad, but I want to be their friend, coach and mentor as well. So I, I feel that the more I invest in myself, the more that my boys will be better off and the people around me. And that's a huge motivator because I have everything I've ever wanted and more. And so it's about not losing it and then fine tuning it. And, uh, and, and goals have been a big part of that for me. I've just written down everything. I went back to a paper planner. So yeah, write them down and, and uh, just re recognize certain strategies. So, you know, like if you write down more than three, it starts becoming a list. It's like a to-do list and less likely to, you know, so, you, you know, put, if you write down 10 things that you want to do in a week, put asterisks beside, beside three of them that are the most important so that you're kind of prioritizing some or the other. And, and I am a product of little wins. Just little incremental wins. And that, I feel like that help, kind of helps structure your life a little bit better, right? And it just grows oh, from there. You know, it, one thing you nail there, and this is, it removes decisions. We make too many decisions. <clears throat> and so, like, if you, part of my, like, week, you know, my pre-planning for the week, my pre-goals for the week is to schedule in what I need to schedule and, and put in where I'd like to, my, you know, my hike to be or when, or when it would be. And if I write it in, it alleviates mm. that decision that morning. Mm. And so you're not pondering, you're not wasting reducing time. Reducing decisions. Yeah. It, it, reducing decisions um, and more clarity on how to schedule your week. I've just been through so many years of awful time management. And my wife, Diana, she was working for a big firm accounting firm. We were both overworked for like the first, like well overworked for years together. And, and now uh, it's much, much better. She's not a big firm accountant and I have much better freedom than I used to. What worked for you in terms of moving from being overworked to the struct more structured schedule that you're on now? Cause I feel like from my perspective, I'm years behind that. And so for example, you say schedule a hike. If I haven't been on a hike in a while, yeah, I'll be like, okay, tomorrow at 10 AM I'm going to see more for three hours, whatever. But something will come up in the morning. A client will text me and say, hey, there's three new properties I want to see. And I'm immediately looking at those things. Or I'll get an email that takes an hour of time to rep reply to or put together some sort of evaluation or something. And I'm doing it immediately because it almost makes me anxious to let it sit. Mm -hmm. That's So that's and something you, you have to get over, right? Yeah. Like, But there is a balance that you could find the right balance that gets you helps you get over it in a way that you're still not, um, how do I say, you know, uh, neglecting neglecting the yeah. situation so the problem with our business problem with being a realtor is that you're on call for uh you're on call for your clients and we're talking about life-changing moves right so if you drop the ball by being absent for a day that could impact someone's life somewhat where they live um or how they get there and so it's a lot of pressure and you don't you want to have a positive impact on people's lives not a negative one that's the problem with it we're a service business that's on call so i guess the thought is and this is one of the biggest advice I could give to younger people in it. And, and it takes time to get there. I recognize if you're living paycheck to paycheck and not financially stable, not looking at your phone is an opportunity, is a chance that you could miss your next paycheck. Once you get financially secure to a certain level, it is crucial to start the practice of time blocking and, and finding the balance of how to time block that works with you. And what you're going to find uh, is that if you miss a phone call or a text, the worst case scenarios, 99% of the time aren't bad. Like yeah. it, it not, well, sorry, not the worst case scenarios, 99% of the time, well, maybe 95, whatever you want to call it. 
it doesn't change a thing. So do you want to be receptive to text communication, instant messages, emails throughout the entire day for that one to 5% of instances? Or do you want to get your life back knowing that it's one to 5% of times that you might miss out on something. And mm -hmm. it's not 5% of times. It is less than that. For sure. So, you know, if I was a, a young hustler and worried about that, I'd probably have um, a morning check-in time for my communication. Uh, maybe I'd have three, you know, maybe I'd have a morning, a midday and, an, and a, a late afternoon, early evening, but I would make sure that there's a three hour gap somewhere in that schedule. Um, and ideally more than one. And so like maybe a three hour gap in the afternoon where you schedule your appointments and showings and a three hour gap. Well, no, sorry. Like, okay. So what I've found emails and important communication and, and, and real high level stuff do in the morning when your brain, brain's clear meetings and scheduling stuff and being out there. Most times people are off work in the afternoon. So you know that that's going to happen. So when are you likely to not uh, affect someone's life in a, in, a, in a miserable stance as a realtor, mm -hmm. probably midday. You know, so if you have your, you know, I, I, I like to preach when you wake up, don't look at your phone, like for 30 minutes, just get through some other like wake up routine that doesn't involve looking at your phone for 30 minutes. Then if, then you look at your phone and you deal with the important stuff that comes from that phone call, then you, then you, but you give yourself 30 minutes to do it, maybe an hour, whatever you choose, but then you are not allowed to look at that phone again. And then you get through your emails down or whatever it is. You, you plan your CMA, you do your CMAs for the day. You do whatever important task. you block out an hour or two and do whatever's important that you just need to get done. If you have a CMA that night, listing appointment, you do it in the morning because you get it out of the way. And, and I say this stuff and not that I do it all the time, but, <laughs> but this is, this is how you, I think you get your life back. So you do the most important task early. If you have to check your phone, realize that no one expects you to get back into them until like 9 a.m. ish. Mm -hmm. So the sooner you get in the habit of getting up at 6 a.m. or 6.30 a.m., there's a lot of time there where you can get stuff done without worrying about the obligation of communication. Mm -hmm. So if it were me, I'd try to get up at 6 or 6.30 or whatever you can do. I'm sometimes getting up at 5, but I can't do it every day. Um, would do whatever you can do so that you can get your run in, your workout in, get through your, your, your task, your listing presentation, your, whatever your project is that moves your business forward and not operates your, well, sorry, a listening presentation is servicing your business. I like to think that there should be some time blocking to working on your business every week. So aside from reacting to emails and reacting to listing appointments, there needs, you know, for you, Denny, you're a sales leader on the team. Um, uh, for me, I'm working on whatever's broken CRM or what, who, who knows what. Um, but the, there's, there's always something where you're working on the business that's not time sensitive. And, and if you put that in your planner and you write it in and say, here's my hour that I'm going to dedicate to this, that is one hour or two hours or whatever it is where you are building your business and not living in it. And so I think it's important to put some build, business building on the roster, put your email time and communication time on the roster, realize that people don't expect to get, you, get a, you to get back to them until 9 or 10 a.m. Sure, get, send them something at 7 if you want to look like a hero. Great, your call. <laughs> but from, if you don't pick up the phone from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. every day, your life is probably going to be no different. Or you might miss out on 1% of the things because the mm -hmm. people that are anxious are getting you first in the morning or they're available in the evening time. Mm -hmm. That's when all the action items happen. So you figure out where that dull window is and you put in some me time. And you learn on the way there through podcasts and you sweat and burn off energy and get in nature or whatever it is. Um, but you, you create this little void of me time. I know you're not anymore, but have you in the past been hesitant of showing through social media, really that me time in the middle of the day? Yeah. <laughs> and how do you, how do you balance that? Or how do you explain to people that? Yes. Unfortunately in our career, these three hour window is the slowest time of the day and it's from 11 to two or what, you know, whatever, yeah. but I'm not going to take a <laughs> selfie of me on my computer at 11 45 PM when you're sleeping, it, 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 showing you So that. You know, to answer your question, yeah. I got so tired of explaining it that I just stopped <laughs> posting it. <laughs> so, so they're not going to understand, right? Yeah. Like you, people's nature to like human nature, not everyone, but you know, if, 
you like to jab at people, right? Yeah. You like to knock someone down or, 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 or bring something up and, and well, he's not working. He's out on a hike on a mountain. I get that all the time. Um, you'll notice I have posted less mountain pictures this year. I am not on the mountain as much as I'd like to, and I work my ass off, but they don't know my schedule. And one of these days I'll take a picture of it because I do draw pictures on it. Um, but, uh, to answer your question, Denny, I think you have to decide. Uh, I think there's a balance. I don't mm -hmm. think you need to, sh well, for me, what I found mm -hmm. is I don't need to show people what I'm doing all the time. So I've turned, um, I, obviously, you know, I don't, I'm not as active on Instagram. I'm, I'm very active on Instagram, but not in the same way I used to be. Um, I've kind of adopted this practice. Sometimes less is more. So, uh, I, I just don't post all the time because I'm going to post the best ones. And so the joy of posting mm -hmm. is outweighed by the perception that I'm leisurely hiking every day when that is far from the truth. I, right now I get out for about two a week. I used to try to get out like for five or something like that, but I had less kids then. Um, I get out for about two a week and I, if it's not something that's rare and unique or in the right lighting, I'm, I'm, I'm not even bringing my phone half the time. If it's like, if it's in the safe zone, I, I even leave my phone in the car. If you see my car outside of a trailhead, don't break in. I need that phone. But if, <laughs> if I'm going on a big one, I bring my, uh, my Google phone and I take really nice pictures and I capture, capture the moment really well. And I just kind of just basically went from stop posting all these hikes to like pick cherry picking my best ones. I don't get out as much as I used to, but I still do get out a lot. And, uh, it was because the perception, uh, probably influenced the decision a little bit. Mm. Um, but then I also got less joy out of posting everything too. So it was kind of two and two, like both of them happened at the same time. So yeah, I don't need to post everything. I don't know if that answered your question. I kind of mumbled a lot there. Mm. Um, I know you love to post and you'd like to share that all, but then you have to decide as what, like Instagram's kind of your life resume in a way. That's the way I look at it. I, I kind of look at my feed as what do I want to scroll back on when I'm older and when I, when my kids are looking at how I lived at this time. Yeah. Um, uh, what do I want that to look like? And so I, I just didn't need multiple hike posts every week. Just me. And I just didn't want to. But it's a pretty help. big part of your life. It is a pretty big part. Um, but keep in mind, if you post something and you're trying to get engagement from it, I guess I guess I got I got burned out from social media is really the answer, Denny. Mm -hmm. I mean, I post something. I want people to like this photo. There's too many nice photos on Instagram, so it's just one of many. If I say <laughs> something quirky to get engagement, then I have to reply to these things, and then that's just more of my time in my life. So I'm better off just not posting anything and just capturing the funny moments of me and my kids, and then post the epic hikes when they come. Um, but yeah, I, I I just treat it differently. I've changed, is what it is. Five years ago, I'd love to post every hike. Five years from now, I might love posting every hike. I might not give one damn uh, of what people think. Not that I react to what people think often. I just react to, do I want to have these conversations? Do I, is it worth posting for these conversations? Do I, does this help the perception of who I am mm -hmm. in any way? And if I'm posting every hike, I, in theory, should be posting all the things I do in real estate and beer and home and, and balance it out a little bit. Uh, Cause I'm not, I'm I, hiking's just part of my life. Have you thought about having multiple? Instagrams? I did. I do. And I don't use them. Yeah, I have Brewery Dog. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't use that. I, uh, I, you know what? I, so, social media for me is uh, at this stage of my life and likely for the next five to 10 years. I don't, I like Instagram, but I, I, I'm more quality over quantity in, in my approach now. So I'd rather have less but more meaningful posts on Instagram. Let's talk about Instagram for a moment. Mm. Less, more meaningful things, things that I want to remember when I'm older. So if I go on a hike and I really want to remember that hike 10 years from now, I'm going to post that picture or like, you know, stuff. So it's a mix of, there's some real estate jabs in there. Cause you know, we're in real estate and we got to promote that every once in a while, but that's the least interesting stuff that I post mm -hmm. is the real estate. The most important stuff for me is the moments with my kids and the occasional, you know, trip and travel and, and, and hike. And yeah, I will post more, more hikes moving forward. I will, but I just haven't been on them as much. So uh, Instagram to me is a bit draining because it's so instant mm. and you get engagement and then you get in conversations. And I know you love that, but when those conversations take away FaceTime from your kids, it's a different Apple. It's a different priority set. 
So um, what I look at Instagram is what do I want to reflect back on when I'm later in life and, or what do I want my kids to see how my life was um, if they, they lose me one day. Um, but I also feel that in, in any moment now will be launched uh, the right platforms for me. Well, Instagram's always going to be there. YouTube. I have a YouTube channel now. So I'm going to, I like YouTube because the content's more permanent. I'm new and awful at it, but I'd like to think I'm going to get better at it over time. So YouTube for me, I like video. I like sharing experiences through video. It's a good way to storytell. And I have one of my goals this year is do 40 videos. And I think I'm 15 ish deep or maybe 20 now. Um, and from that 40 videos, what I hope to get out of it is not build a following and become an epic YouTube star, but to get clarity on the types of videos that I like doing, to get better at editing the videos, to get better at storytelling and to do it in less time. So I'm really trying to get clarity on how to share the fun things that I do. And I feel like video is a great platform. So YouTube's a great platform. Instagram's great because I like it. It's simple. And then I, I, yeah, I'm going to have my personal blog up too, which I'll be able to go in more detail. And, you know, the thing about YouTube is, you know, you can, I had, I, you could have 20 videos about building a house um, or merge them into one, but in a blog, you can really organize that content and really give direction with attachments and prints. So if there's something like, you know, building a brewery, building a new brewery, uh, building a house, um, uh, routine health training, anything that I want to go deep on, I think that I'm going to be more into the personal blog stuff which is a combination of YouTube, putting the videos there, putting them on a blog in an organized way, giving more content, doing it less frequently, and then just sharing little jabs in my life through Instagram. So I, I did not have that clarity before. Even I think, you know, I want to do a podcast one day, but that's not in the Rolodex anytime soon. <laughs> so I, but I, I realize I have more clarity on when it's right, the right time for me to happen. I have about two years of a lot of things I want to do and, and, and reducing my financial risk, um, maybe three. And then I hope that when I get my finances to where I'd like them to be and my risk to where I'd like it to be, I will have a lot more time for creativity. And that's when you might see me either in the open mic, stand up comedy or <laughs> podcast, or who knows, you know, I, I don't know, but I, I, the one void in my life is I, I have more creativity in me. That's not getting out. I'm a creative guy and uh, I, I want to get it out. So I don't know when that's going to happen, but it, it should happen when my finances are where I want them to be. And it's really just from a risk standpoint right now. I went on a tangent there, Denny. Yeah. That was a pretty good way to end. Yeah. I think Yeah, I was going to ask you about like, where, where is James Garber going from here? But you basically just summarized it in the last four minutes. Dad life. <laughs> Being a, yeah, the mm -hmm. ultimate goal. I you know there's so many ultimate goals, but really just to sum it up, I guess learning as much as I can about, business, health, nutrition, um, psychology. So I understand people, the way they think and why they think things and relationships and, um, and having a better standing of where we came from and where we're going and uh, all that. There's so many interesting things in that, but basically being a smarter, wider perspective human, raise good kids that are good in a way, like honest, have values, growth-minded, and they're really closed-minded right now, but I'd like to think I get them more open-minded and hardworking and, and, and passionate about something. Um, and just having close relationships with them. I mean, the ultimate, like you can have, yes, I want to do this much commission and sell this many homes. But, uh, when you look at the highest level goals, it's, I want to be that guy that my kids call when they are drunk and stuck in a, you know, whatever. So I'll be like, I was way drunker than that at your age. <laughs> 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 no. Um, yeah, uh, where I'm, ten years. I, well, I think I shared with you growing this team, growing Steel and Oak, and whatever business Steel and Oak gets in, um, uh, doing bigger health challenges, um, spending. I don't know. Like it's going to be more focused on family and kids, really, in the five ten years. And then they're going to hate. Like they're going to be. I'm going to be that embarrassing dad because I'm going to embarrass the shit out of them. Uh, and then I think probably 15 years from now, I'll probably have this big void of kids that are older and don't care about me anymore. And then I'm going to be like a workaholic again, showing houses and, and knocking on doors and cold calling. I, I have no clue. <laughs> <laughs> You're an inspirational guy, even just from, um, like doing that race in Portugal, I probably had like 25 people message me yeah. saying, holy shit, did he actually just do that? Cause I posted something on my social. So I would, I would encourage you to continue to share the journey. Don't ever feel like one negative comment pushes you back or 
or stalls you from posting yeah. something because I think there's a lot of positive impact that all the crazy stuff that you're doing uh, brings to a lot of people that maybe don't reach out to you directly. But even just from my perspective, you've helped me grow a ton and a lot of people around you just Thank from you. all of, <laughs> just because of this fearlessness that you have from somewhere. You know, I, I'm going to try to share the journey of what I do better for mm -hmm. the things that I do moving forward. And I, I agree with you. I didn't show my training and the downs as much as I should. And I want to do that better. And that's part of the reason for pushing video. Mm -hmm. um, we're all able to do more than we think. And, sure. and I'd love for people to see the struggles in my head. And I'm just a goofy guy though, you know? So like, even when I'm in pain, I'm goofy, you know? So, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, I, I do plan on doing another ridiculous race. It's going to be harder, probably be like 30 hours or multiple days. <laughs> I will be so beat up and in pain from it. And it will be an incredible story whether I finish or lose or don't. And that's not a loss. It's just whether I finish or don't. Um, you got to uh, find a drone with a 30 hour battery life that can just follow you. I thought about <laughs> planting my drone like on the trail <laughs> and, and getting to it, but uh, the extra weight wasn't worth it. Yeah. And um, you know what? Not droning. I'm not droning in a race. I'm not <laughs> droning in a race. It's just there's no good time. Uh, and usually the best parts of the drone would be at a mountaintop and the odds of a mountaintop being clear. Yeah, you know, there's so many things you learn in life, Danny. If I brought the drone, I'd be bringing up that volcano and it'd be in a cloud. What am I going to do with the drone in cloud? Technology will get better. <laughs> we can just have one follow you around. Yeah. Or well, lighter. No, but I appreciate the kind words. And, you know, <laughs> I need to actually hear this feedback to, to be pushed to do it. Um, I never, I, uh, the most engaging post that I've ever had was the one when I finished the race and it kind of dawned on me like, well, geez, if it gets another person out running or doing something positive, I should do a better job of sharing it. And I hope to, I just don't know if I can do it year round day to day on Instagram. So I got to batch it in a way that works for me. That's, I guess that's one thing to think about with Instagram is how much of it is for yourself versus how much of it could potentially add value to someone else's life. Right. Because even just, I don't share a lot of this fitness thing that I'm doing this year, but I've had probably 20. I don't think I'm exaggerating there. 20 people like either message me on Instagram or text, or I had two of my building property managers I'd approach me in the last couple of months and just be like, what do you, like, are you training for something? I'm like, no, I just want to see like if I can do it. something, Denny. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah. and both of them were like, well, how do I start? I'm like, I don't know if I'm the right guy to ask. I just decided that I wanted to do it. <laughs> but that's what I was saying. I think it's just a decision. And the first day, two and a half years ago, I ran for six minutes. That's all I could do. I was. I remember when you were embarrassed about yourself with, with how fat you were. I was, <laughs> you said you had fat go over your belt. And you're like, never again. <laughs> seriously. <laughs> seriously. Yeah, I went through a fat stage too. You know, I, 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 I had it. I think everyone needs a thicker moment in life where their balance is so out of whack that they mm -hmm. get soft. Um, but yeah, you're right. Uh, I, I guess, you know what? I mean, even to your listeners, like I just need it. You need to hear it to, yeah. to know, like, it's not like I'm going to do it all the time because I don't have time for the engagement. But if you're getting 20 messages and I got a flood of messages from my race, there's probably a hundred plus people that you're still inspiring that just aren't communicating. Exactly. And um, probably more than that. That is a motivator for me. It's not the number one. But I, I would like to, uh, I'd like to encourage more people to challenge themselves, basically. Mm -hmm. And if, it's probably a motivator for you to continue sharing the journey, but not yeah. not to push you internally to do the next one. No, it's probably more just like if I share this, it could help someone else. Whereas the races for you are just like I think I can do this. Yeah, I think right? I got this. I had so yeah. many people tell me like after pneumonia, you shouldn't do this race. I'm like, well, did, what did your doctor say? I'm like, well, if I asked him, he's going to say no. <laughs> so I didn't ask him. <laughs> you know, uh, but yeah, um, there. But you know, I get just as much joy like out of sharing like a real estate project. Like I'd like to, and I do that a little bit. But I, that's part of the reason for doing. It. I want to share business startups, mm -hmm. the build out. You know. Um, uh, a house construction, a renovation project. Eventually I'm going to do some really cool bigger ones that are going to be a lot of fun. And it would be great to just go behind the curtain of how it actually works. Like, I mean, we're still in the dark with how developers work and all the numbers of that, like the general public. It'd be great for some guy that just doesn't give a shit to tell everybody, here's the numbers, here's the rates, here's how much cash you need, here's how much it's going to make, here's how people evaluate it. 
I think that would be a value. Mm. And then mix in the occasional crazy race and kite surfing video. And, and uh, yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot of things that I, there's a lot of ideas up here. <laughs> yeah. I got music videos in the plans with my kids. I, I really want to do some sort of like <laughs> rap music video in my backyard with the kids. So Charlie really said that there's a bigger chance of me doing it. Exactly. Yeah. Charlie's got some moves. He does have moves and I could capture those moves in a rap music video. <laughs> Do you Charlie's get, Charlie's like uh, one and a half, right? Is that yeah. your youngest? He's, like, yeah. he's twenty months. I saw yeah, him dancing two. to your Father's Day card. That was a yeah, he's got he's got a little swagger. Awesome. He's been dancing for a good eight months now. <laughs> yeah, he's been stable for about eight months. Yeah, he moves. <laughs> he's got it in him. So, I, it, but there's a window where they're going to be small and goofy. Yeah, and if I don't like, so I have this little time crunch where I got to capture this in the most hip hop <laughs> way possible. <laughs> what song are you do? Ah, uh, well, you know, I'm giving away too much here. Um, <laughs> but the more I, the more I talk about it, the more likely I am to do it. I think right now, uh, oh, did it delete? No, uh, I'm thinking, oh, no, not candy shop. <laughs> uh, Flow Rida, I think, my house. Um, Those are fun. GDFR featuring Sage the Gemini. <laughs> what does that mean? I, don't <laughs> I, don't know. Know. I just listened to it and I thought it was dope. <laughs> I'm like, this would make a great backyard music video. So more likely to do it now. There you go. Yeah. Love it. We'll see where the next steps go. I just, I, I'm inspired by a lot of people doing cool things and I want to get a little better at capturing a video. I'm sure this is going to be first of many podcasts together. I hope so. But on number two, I fully expect to hear about the makings of this rap video. You know, and this was an idea that like just came up like three <laughs> days ago. So the fact that I'm sharing it here now gave you the song title said I want to do it is going to put my like, uh, you know, my accountability to the test here. It's going to be the intro yeah. for the next podcast. Oh, I just got to, I've never done a music video before. Can I even post it on YouTube as Flow Riders music? I don't think Will so. Will they take it off? I think so. I think so. Yeah. They won't. If let, someone mm. complains or says anything. Yeah. yeah. So even Instagram, I posted, a, I didn't even know, but it makes sense now. <laughs> I posted a video to Instagram with a song in the background and like 15 minutes later, I got a message saying your video has been taken down. It just takes it off. So you're going to have to contact Flora, Florida. Uh, it's difficult. <laughs> Get some or rights there. instruct people to push play now. <laughs> Just, it's not going to be the same. Oh, I, I'm going to have to find some uncopywritten hip hop. Uh, Get your kids to sing it. Not going to be very good. We'll see how I'll, I'll, I'll problem solve this entrepreneur resilience here. Right, you, got, you know, this is one roadblock along the path of my backyard music video. It doesn't have to be Flo Rida. All right. Let's no, get out appreciate of here. being on the podcast, man. Um, what number of podcasts is this? Uh, 60 50s? something. Yeah. yeah. Impressive, man. You've stuck to it. You're on your path to 100 this year, right? So that was one of the things I, yeah. I was going to oh, bring up with the goals yeah. is that I had this like imaginary goal of doing 100 this year. And I've come to realize that the number of doing 100 is not going to bring me any joy. But what the this crazy goal in, in my mind has brought me is that it's so powerful to network with people. So I've just enjoyed the process of meeting a bunch of new people rather than this mystical n number of no harm in changing right? the goal. Yeah. What action steps do you want to force yourself to do though, to get like, is it more, obviously it's more about quality than quantity. See, that's the thing I'm finding is that the idea of staying up till 11, 12 at night and messaging people on Instagram Saying, hey, to hit your hundred. You want to come yeah. on my podcast? Yeah. That's not fun for me. Yeah. But also, also the some, actual art of the podcast and meeting new people and hearing their experience, that's the fun part. Also, you might get like random fillers, right? Episodes that aren't as good if you're just trying to fill the time. Correct. Yeah. Well, so it's, if, it's a balance. I'm still trying yeah. to figure it out and how to make it, how to get this and the fun part as many times as I want to do in a year with balancing how much of the non fun stuff I want to do. <laughs> You got to make it, you got to keep it fun and totally. interesting. I mean, we, we could talk about, so we could do a full real estate one, full whatever, sure. you know, like we could go on so many tangents, but for you, if it's, if it's about getting inspired by people you haven't known and, and meet, you know, to me, it's like, okay, well, how many contacts do you want to make a week, you know? And, yeah. and what, what do you want to hold yourself to? Cause if there's nothing, if there's no goal, there's nothing. Yeah. But if it's like, I want to reach out to 12 people that inspire me every week and invite yeah. them onto my podcast, that's something, yeah. whether they go, whether they say yes or no, that's on them, but at least you can control your side of that. Right. Yeah. 
So, you know, that's what I'm just trying to get you to think of in terms of, or when I'm saying action steps is what is the meaningful action step? Who cares about the outcome? Well, no, the outcome's always there on the little side note, but um, what do you, like, you made that goal without having a, a podcast established. There's no <laughs> question in my mind that that goal should be revised. Yeah. Um, if you hit the hundred and you had 10 filler ones that you're not excited about, did you really win? Yeah. You know, yeah. uh, so um, at least now you have more clarity. For sure. Quality over quantity. So I would only do the COD podcast that inspire you moving forward. And I would change that goal immediately. And you can still have your old goal written down, but there needs to be something that replaces it. Written down. Start like every it. week. Put it your wall, <clears throat> Let's leave on that. Tattoo it on your shoulder. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thanks for coming on, Jamie. Yeah, I'm sure we're going to do more in the near future. We didn't even talk about beer, which is ridiculous. But there's a lot of other things that we could talk about. Yeah, well, next time we should try. Next have, time we should just have a lineup of beer. Everyone, I was just gonna say, we'll get all 16 of whatever yeah. Steel Oak has at the time <laughs> on their tablet. And we'll do we'll do every one. I like it. We'll make bad decisions together. <laughs> <laughs> Carl, can you drive us that day? <laughs> I'll be the DD. <laughs> Unreal. Okay. Good night, guys. Thank you.